request our speakers to kindly occupy this stage on the here, the seats on the stage, and we will begin the session in the next one. Welcome you all to our today's national workshop, and the topic for today's workshop is the E in ESG Reflections for Corporate Governance and Sustainability. The conference is organized by Delhi School of Advanced Studies in sponsorship. And it's sponsored by a uh, National Foundation for Corporate Governance (NSCG). About the School of Advanced Studies, we are uh, a, an institution which was established as a trust in 1998 with the purpose of providing academic learning program with Delhi as its sponsoring society. We are a globally recognized university in the sphere of sustainability and sustainable studies. Uh, and the university aims to create a knowledge through research and co contribute to the disclosure on sustainability issues at national and local levels. Uh, it also aims to de design and deliver academic programs, training and research on sustainability issues relevant to all streams of life and across age groups, assimilating the latest science and evidence. Uh, we are now going to discuss about NFCG, uh, a little bit about NFCG. Uh, it was established in 2003 uh, by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, which led a unique PPP model to set up the NSCG in partnership with the CII, Confederation of Indian Industry, the Institute of Company Secretaries of India, and the Institution Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants of India. Subsequently, the Institute of Cost Accountants of India, the National Stock Exchange, and the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs also joined with an objective to promote good corporate governance practices both at the level of individual corporate uh, and industry as a whole. NSCG endeavors to create a, a business environment that promotes the voluntary adoption of good corporate governance practices. Uh, for our today's session, we are uh, honored to have an illustrious panel here with us comprising Mrs. Sri Prakash, Distinguished Fellow at Delhi. Mr. N.P.S. Tavla, uh, Central Council Member ICSI, Dr. Ritu Gupta, Professor at National Law University, uh, Ms. Manjari Chaudhary, General uh, Council Maruti Suzuki, and we also have Dr. Vidhi Madan Chadda, who is the Assistant Professor and Head here at Delhi School of Advanced Studies and also the Organizer and Coordinator of this workshop. Uh, I request Dr. Vidhi to welcome our speakers with a clap. And we 
we have curated some shortlisted entries here in this book of apps. And I request all the speakers to roll the scroll and release the book. I now invite Dr. Vidhi, the program director for this workshop, to brief up about, about this conference and to tell us why we are all here today. <laughs> of business sustainability in general and ESG in particular was conceived sometime uh, during the mid of 2022 amidst several developments both at national and international levels for institutionalizing, embedding and integrating sustainability into businesses for uh, you know which makes year 2022 as the watershed year for ESG evolving ESG framework. From COP27 and other, and other uh, international fora stressing upon the need for an integrated climate and nature-based solutions to meet our environmental goals and growing sentiment that the investors and, and consumers are becoming savvier towards global concerns of climate change, its mitigation, GHG emissions, energy transitions, to name a few. Then there have been key moves at the national front from introduction of national hydrogen policy to RBI's discussion paper on climate risk and sustainable finance, SEBI's consultation papers on uh, ESG rating providers, mutual funds, green and blue bonds, launch of life campaigns supporting Indian youth in climate action efforts are all positive steps toward building a more sustainable and responsible economy. Today it is understood that businesses have a major role to play in any economic setup and their contribution is intrinsically related to the success or failure of any commitments that they make within the country and at international levels. Such commitments have led to the developing and evolving of new frameworks including the one on environmental, social and governance obligations for businesses. The spirit of ESG is not mere compliance, but the contribution towards ensuring sustainability at all levels, which in turn ensures business continuity and sustenance. To quote here an African proverb, if you have to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This echoes the spirit with which businesses must undertake their ESG journey. As businesses today attempt to reassess, reimagine, rethink, re realign, and reevaluate their purpose, this workshop is a small contribution to aid the businesses in the said transition. The workshop brings together members from academia, research, corporates, regulators, think tanks, policy together to create a consensus on various environmental factors of reporting under ESG framework, analyze international best practices, review Indian practice and perspectives towards fulfilling global standards, evolve policy changes, and facilitate thought leadership in the realm of ESG. Presently, the E in ESG has gained a lot of momentum since it enjoys a higher level of recognition amongst the stakeholders involved in the corporate sustainability debate. Hence, the focus of this present workshop is on e-metrics of ESG, and the disclaimer being that ESG is not limited to environmental aspects only and goes much beyond encompassing the social and the governance perspectives. During the course of the day, the event will witness two panel discussions by subject experts delving on the themes 
of corporate governance where they uh, deliberate upon the way forward on the environmental disclosures and standardization. And the second panel will take up uh, the agenda of uh, evolving the trends, discussing the evolving trends of environmental responsibility of corporates. It will be followed by paper presentations on the theme. One of the striking feature of the workshop has been the participation by the professionals, researchers, uh, members of the think tank, of academia and students from possibly all streams, whether it's science, policy, management, economics and commerce in the domain, all of them specializing in the domain of ESG, ensuring diversity of perspective and interdisciplinary approach towards demystifying ESG. I must at this point acknowledge that the workshop is sponsored by National Foundation for Corporate Governance, an initiative of Ministry of Corporate Affairs with CII, ICSI, ICI, ICMI, ISCA and NSC as able partners. I hope this workshop is able to meet its objectives and serve as a platform to take it forth in the meaningful discourse on ESG forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, your words of wisdom. Now we would like to begin the session, uh, and I would now like to invite Ms. Manjri Chaudhary for her session today. Yes. Or Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's indeed an honor to be here today. It takes me back many, many, many years, and I've quite forgotten that at one point in time. I started my career as an academician, and here I am in the corporate world. And I was just talking to Mr. Uh, Shri Prakash that that's where I'm going to end. So it's going to be a full circle. Uh, I am also here today uh, as a, a representing GCAI, which is uh, the General Counsel's Association of India, of which I am a founding member. And we have had the privilege of having a partnership with Terry uh, to uh, partner with them, on, especially on the theme of ESG. So uh, there will be my fellow colleagues who would be speaking at the next two panels. And I'm quite mindful of what they would be talking about. So I tried to make sure that I do not overlap with what they may have to say. And since this is the morning inaugural session, I and you have a long day ahead of you to think and you know ruminate over what ESG is. I thought I'll just start with today only by first, of course, thanking Terry and uh, the National Foundation for Corporate Governance for giving me this opportunity of being here with you, uh, with bright young minds who are really concerned and very anxious and very curious to know how the world is reacting to, um, uh, to environment uh, in the E in the ESG. And uh, it is, it's an absolute pleasure. So here's what I'm going to use the next 10, 15 minutes to talk to you about. Uh, since we are talking on reflections on corporate governance and sustainability with specific reference to the E in the ESG, um, I'm going to uh, give you a broad understanding of what really, I think it's not something that you don't know, but again, you know, just to set the context of where ESG and how it is and uh, what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, attention it is generating in the recent times. And then take you on to more talking about um, on the corporate side, since I come from the corporate world, so I thought let me give you a flavor of how corporates uh, uh, need to look at how do you marry corporate governance with the, with the sustainability and to the E of the positive environmental impact that we corporates are now looking to have uh, under this whole ESG platform. So, um, and I'm sure it will set this, it will create a segue into the discussions that have to come during the day. And what my fellow panelists here would, of course, bring in, be, we have a great panel of all, you know, people from the academia, people from industry. So, um, uh, please um, requ uh, request your attention for the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, 
when we talk of ESG, you know, everyone, it's been the buzzword. We all understand that for the last about a um, couple of years. But I think uh, the pandemic has uh, really uh, brought it into our radar very, very more, more sort of specifically where everybody has woken up to it. The government was doing something around business responsibility and sustainability even before this. And um, but uh, the pandemic told us that we have been tampering with nature a way too long, right? And the nature decided to lock us in and actually decided to have a good time outside. So everybody individually started thinking about what they need to give back to the world and to, to the nature and to uh, the environment. Uh, more than just about, you know, making a living all the time. So every individual began to think like that. And corporates are also made up of individuals. And they began to think on the same lines. Uh, coupled with this, we saw a lot of activism in terms of... Uh, in 2020, we had the World Economic Forum where, where it actually this was uh, made a focus. You know, they've talked about environment and sustainability and what uh, big companies need to look at and followed by the COP26 and the COP27, and we're all aware of that. It, it's kind of flowed from there. Most recently, last year, a SEBI decided to make ESG disclosures compulsory starting 1st of April 2023, where the top 1,000 listed entities in India are expected to provide, make disclosures on their ESG standing. Um, it's early days, of course, you know, we are taking baby steps and this is likely to evolve just the way I think CSR and corporate social responsibility has evolved. Uh, so, as we think about ESG, um, it continues to gain traction in line with increasing demand for greater transparency and accountability from different types of stakeholders and also with the statutory disclosure, just as I mentioned, that's really coming up. ESG today is positioning itself as a critical factor that can impact value creation. That's the difference. The E in the environment for corporate world used to stand for causing no net harm to the nature. And I was discussing this with uh, uh, Vidhi just before the session that, you know, that's the big shift. When, when we talk of no net harm to the nature, it talks of limiting emissions, making sure that you, your effluents are well managed. You are not uh, throwing up smoke into the air, which is going to create a, a harm. So no net harm was the policy earlier. Now, uh, the recent movement across the globe is towards causing net positive impact. That is the difference from no net harm to net positive impact on the environment, which is, let me give you some examples, which is net zero carbon emissions. We all talk of that carbon neutrality. Prime Minister Modi has uh, discussed so much about it. Um, circular economy extended producer responsibilities. You talk of the new plastic waste management rules, uh, the laws that are coming up, there is an extended producer responsibility. All of these are moving in the direction of not just net zero harm, but net uh, positive uh, you know, impact on the environment. So these topics, why have they gained significance? They have gained significance because of the emerging concerns around resource scarcity, climate change, and environmental toxicity, etc. Well, these are many areas which we all understand. That's why these are gaining importance. Now, the government, let's talk of how the regulator and the government is looking at it. There has been a huge focus from the government on climate and environment. We are quite aware of that after COP26 and then COP27 and, you know, the five-point program of Prime Minister Modi. And he's even talked of how, you know, lifestyle management is also has to be sustainable for all of us to take this forward, right? Uh, so in the recent times and in the recent budget too, as you may have seen, there's been a whole attention on areas such as hydrogen, renewable energy, biofuel use, sustainable agriculture, forestry, you know, and how we can make our environment more safe and, and, uh, and, and so that it flourishes and we can flourish with it. And accordingly, given that this regulator is moving in this direction, we see that there is a significant investor pressure 
all companies to show performance against E related KPIs. KPIs are key performance indicators. So the investor today, a company, you all must know that how does a company run? The company is incorporated by investors. Investors invest money, there are promoters, and they they have a stake in how the company runs. So today it is not about just the regulator, but because the regulator has made certain uh, things important and mandatory, there is a pressure, the pressure from the investor today and our stakeholders have increased on companies to focus on these E-related KPIs. So when you talk of what, how is the company going to perform in a year, what are the areas you have to focus on, E-environment related, uh, these KPIs become extremely important, right? So corporates basically today have moved from stakeholder primacy. Earlier we used to always think stakeholder is the most, what do, what do we do? Shareholder and stakeholder value. That's what companies are set up for. You have to generate value for people who've invested in your company. From Now focus primarily on that. From there, it is moved to encompassing holistic stakeholder capitalism. So there is a capitalism. Companies are not not for profit. Companies are for profit organizations. So there is a capitalism element that is there with it. But from just focusing on stakeholder uh, needs and you know giving uh, generating wealth for them, it is now moved to a more holistic capitalism. The important question that needs to be addressed is the effective translation of the ESG goals into very realistic very measurable and very trackable progress across business activities. How do you how do you measure them, therefore? How do you manage, a, if your KPI has to be related, there has to be a mechanism for doing that. And that is going to, you know, bring me into uh, the topic that we are discussing today. So, environmental stewardship. Now, when we talk of E-related KPIs, so what does corporate need to do? It needs to show environmental stewardship. That means you have to drive it. You have to come to the front as a leader and steer it in a, in a particular direction. So environmental stewardship is important and it's also a controversial topic in today's world. Some, we have, there are different views to it. You know, we are still assimilating ourselves. It's a new concept. Everybody is getting their arms around it. It will take a few years to concretize it to, you know, what it will take a shape and form. Um, regulators, investors, your stakeholders and consumers and public at large, they all have a stake now in how businesses approach <coughs> this environmental stewardship. Today, your customer, when my company, which is Maruti Suzuki, we sell cars. They want to know when are we going to get the next EV out. They want to know how we can run the uh, cars more on uh, CNG, how we can run them on flex fuel, which is hydrogen and ethanol, as opposed to uh, diesel and petrol, which could be more polluting. So there is a whole, you know, it's not only about the investors on one side, it is on the stakeholders, it's also about the consumer and the public at large who has woken up to this thought. Um, you know, let me, uh, before I get in, how do we sort of set the context here? I take you back to the World Economic Forum 2020 agenda, the manifesto. That's probably where it all began. It talked about a company is more than an economic unit generating wealth. Performance of a company must be measured not only by the return to shareholders, but also on how it achieves environmental, social, and good governance objectives. So when, you know, it's, they're just two lines, and I've just, I've just picked, them, picked them out of the larger manifesto, but they are very, they very clearly highlight the interaction between business operations on one side and environmental impact on the other, and the importance of this environmental stewardship, which is a reflection of the good corporate governance that the topic is all about. So, so if it is the company that has to lead economic stewardship, who in the company has to think about it? The companies are determined. We have a board, and then we have a management, and then we have employees, and then we have the consumers and the rest of the stakeholders. So it all starts the from the from the board. So as a group, that 
drives long-term organizational value, which is <coughs> the board itself cannot afford to ignore the increasing oversight that ESG responsibilities today have in the boardroom agenda. Suddenly, the board has woken up to the responsibilities on ESG. It is critical, therefore, for, a, for every board member to understand the impact of ESG across the risks and opportunities and business strategy so that they are able to best position the company to maintain and enhance value creation. We have to understand one thing. Companies always have to create value. Otherwise, the economy of the country is going to go down. We are, you know, the GDP is, is a, you know, you have to keep that in mind. So on one hand, there's value creation, but how do you marry your risks, the op business opportunities, your business strategy to ensure that it is related to environment in a manner that it still lands up creating creating value for the, for the company. So, um, Traditionally, a company's board, how does it, earlier, how did the board, they used to manage corporate governance and all the risks. That was amongst one of the very important tasks that a company used to do. But the need is now to expand these responsibilities to account for environmental stewardship and risk management, which is a now relatively new phenomenon. And let me tell you, boards today are not really very equipped to handle this. They are also beginning to get their arms around. It's a new concept. So when I, as a general counsel, uh, heading the legal uh, and the compliance role for the in, in my company or in any other of such as my other fellow uh, general counsels, we deal with the board very extensively. So what I think that one of the first steps that a board can take in this direction is to take a very holistic view to address environmental issues, to discuss them and collaborate with the management. How does the board set an agenda? The board has to give an advice and that advice has to be uh, led by the management and executed by the employees, isn't it? That's how the outcomes happen. So, if you have to set an agenda for environment, the board has to start talking with the management. You have to collaborate with the management. You have to sit and discuss. You have to identify how various business operations of, the, of any corporate uh, interface with environmental issues. Where do they intersect? So, if you are doing something, say for example, when you are selling cars or you're manufacturing, how the manufacturing process and you know can be made more environmental friendly where does environmental in, in, environment intersect a positive impact on environment intersect with the business operations so um, it is important to and it's very important to think broadly here because you can't think in a very narrow way that uh, you know the e in the esg here extends beyond regulatory compliance. Oftentimes we say, okay, said so we said we have to make disclosures or the government has put some regulation. So we have to, you know, abide by it. Everybody, by and large, this is the way we think. But in this, you have to think a little larger than that. Because it is, this, the E part does not stop at regulatory compliance, but it moves outside of your factory gate. And when I say factory gate, it moves outside of your manufacturing operations uh, into the entire value chain, right from the supply chain to product use and to end of life management. When you can look at, you know, you are all familiar with this, you know, supply chains are necessary. So even your supply chain has to be sustainable and environmentally friendly and conscious. Then how you, the product use, you, the manufacturing of it and the use of that product has to be sustainable and having environment. And lastly, uh, the end of life. So when a car attains 15 years, it needs to be scrapped. And that scrappage has to be environmentally friendly. So it's a whole value chain. So you can't be just, just a regulatory piece. Okay. Uh, and we have to understand that the, the, uh, this potential environment risk needs to be considered such in, uh, you know, uh, when you're looking at this, it's not only the one side, it's the other side. You have to see how an environmental risk can cause huge liabilities and huge disclosures to you. So you have to keep 
the balance. So you want to be environmentally friendly, but also making sure that how that needs to be managed in a way that does not create liability. So once these risks are identified, then what is the next step that the board needs to do? Then they need to assess the materiality of these risks. You know, when you are discussing an environmental agenda, you say that, okay, if I have to achieve this from an environmental sustainability standpoint, and I have to tie my business operations to it, what are the risks going to be? And we identify that. Once you've identified those risks, then you have to kind of understand what is the materiality of it. Can they become very high risk? The materiality is very high or it is low risk that you know you can manage so low risk is the area which is the you know no hanging fruit which most corporates would go for because the the bigger uh, risks people would tend to avoid um, and it is important for the company to see how it is going to present itself before the regulators the investors and the society in at large to keep them informed of any potential environmental risks to avoid any reputational harm and increase long-term stakeholder value. That is what these disclosures are all about. Today, when we are going to start making all these disclosures, the government wants, the government says that if you are going to go on an ESG agenda, please inform me. Let me know what you are doing. Is it really going to create a positive impact or is it going to result into some form of risk? If there is a risk, what are, what are you doing as a corporate to manage that risk appropriately? Um, but at times, you know, board members may not be experts on ESG. So what do they need to do? Seek help. You need to bring in experts, form in the form expert committees that can support and guide and advise the board and the management in this direction. And, you know, uh, today, when we look to make disclosures and there are going to be more discussions on how the disclosures are and I'm not going to get into it. But when we are going to see that we have to make these disclosures, we have to follow certain norms, everybody today is challenged at some level or the other to make full sense of what SEBI has kind of put together. You know, they have a nine point you know, guidelines that they have brought out, which every corporate is still finding and getting some moves around. I think everybody's, we've also done that exercise. So I know what uh, what it is. It's pretty extensive. And you have to see that uh, how it's going to tie in into uh, to what you're going to disclose to them. So I believe this will get better over time and you become better at putting what you uh, what you want to there. SEBI becomes better in interpreting and understanding it. They will probably tweak it in the for, uh, coming years, make it a little more stringent and move on. But there is no set formula on how best to manage it. So every corporate entity is different and, and their profile is different and they need to find really their own way to manage this. And but what is important is that both should ensure that management appropriately appreciates the E in the ESG, devotes appropriate time to it, time, resources, and the mind share to address environmental matters and understand the disclosure requirements that they have to make. And I would stress on the word mind share. Now, you know, we have to bring about a change and change management is not easy. It's the slowest process in, in the world is to bring about any change. Shifting from pure financial value to stakeholders to moving to having a more sustainable, environmental friendly, positive, net positive impact on the environment and yet create value for your stakeholders is a complete paradigm shift in the way you have to think. So the mind share of people is important. And uh, lastly, I would say that in all of this, Communication continues to remain the most important thing. We need to talk. Boards need to keep talking to the management. Management need to talk to uh, the investors, the stakeholders, to its employees. Every employee in the company has to be tied in into the agenda that the company is uh, going to operate on. And um, uh, to, to your regulators and to your stakeholders at large. Because uh, the more the communication, the better the clarity and more the mind share as I talked about it. And therefore, governance and sustainability can only flourish when you are really, really bought into the concept. And thank you so much. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the session.
and especially on elaborating the corporate viewpoint on ESG. I think the term for the day for discussion would be the holistic stakeholder capitalism as you discussed. And now I would like to invite our next speaker for today's <coughs> inaugural session. <coughs> So our next speaker for today is Mr. N. P. S. Tabla, Central Council Member, ICSI. <coughs> Let's welcome him with round of applause. Thank you. Madam Munshi, Ritu Ma, Vidhi. Shiv Kashi, all friends here. Good morning. In fact, I just want to say my job is easier. I can just see cut, copy, paste. <laughs> Manjri Madam was so elaborative and she has covered the entire gamut and now she is going also. She says, no, I don't want somebody to see cut, copy, paste. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure, but please excuse me. I do have another commitment. But I promise to return back and you'll be a wonderful audience. And thank you so much. So I am your first student when you join back. <laughs> uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, hear you. Thank you, ma'am, for sir. being here. I am extending uh, this appreciation and thanks on behalf of everybody sitting thank here. You. Big round of applause for ma'am, especially come and take a valuable time on a weekend which is very close to any general council's heart. You know, they work 24/7. Bye, ma'am. See you. Thank Great. Thank you so much. No, I was serious. I was so elaborative that she has covered everything. So I was while sitting uh, there, I was wondering, yeah, I have written a few things, but she is covering most of it. So I don't want to repeat, you know. It's better to uh, uh, speak generally. You know, in fact, I am also a teacher. Vidhi would agree with me if uh, I can disclose that, you know, Vidhi was my student. Uh, in fact, Dr. Vidhi Madan Chadda, as she is now known here, assistant professor. I don't want to. Uh, tell you that your teacher was my student but yes because i also started uh, teaching at a very early age probably i was in first year of graduation or uh, at that time only uh, we were neighbors and in pitapura and vidhi used to come and uh, you know she she imbibed that teacher's spirit in me and there were a few other friends and their siblings also used to come and study together. So I, mean, I never used to teach them, but we used to study together. That's what I felt. And that's today also here in this workshop, I think we are learning from each other. Your interaction uh, in the entire day's program will make it more worthy. Uh, ESG, certainly Vidhi gave this call almost, I think, a month back, uh, requesting our president of the institute to come and uh, participate in this because NFCG is there and institute also uh, is a participant in NFCG from that perspective well, he was already occupied so Vidhi uh, said that why don't you come then he nominated me and that's how I am here. Uh, we talk more on G. G means 2G, 3G nahi, Pita Ji, Mata Ji bhi nahi. Pita Ji, Mata Ji have to be uh, certainly respected and taken care of but today the G I am talking is the G in the ESG. And uh, there, uh, I think in ESG being a company secretary and representative of Institute of Company Secretaries, we are called governance professionals, all company secretaries. And general councils have also become governance professionals because governance is eternal. Any corporate, uh, you can't run a corporate these days without governance. But in this added framework of E and S, and in fact, S has also become very relevant. Our ICSI also has recently launched uh, Institute of Social Auditors because social audit would be the new norm very soon. So S also we have covered. E certainly with E has uh, invoked me to think more on E. We talk uh, more on E, less implement E I think because when we deal with corporates, uh, E is the last priority and Majri Madam was right. You know, e generally now the mindset is being changed. And we work only when a danda is there, you know, when, when, because we don't feel, because every compliance has a cost, we always feel uh, compliance, uh, you know, is uh, actually if you go to ministry or if you go to 
the legislative intent compliance is non negotiable because the cost of non compliance uh, is much more than complying with it but the difficulty is that we don't understand till the time there is a law and there is a penalty attached to it when there is a penalty everybody would be very keen to implement that law otherwise people will ignore you bring up in fact there was a voluntary guidelines nobody used to implement it no these conference workshops were not organized i mean yes with you would certainly organize in even when they are voluntary but otherwise uh, corporates will not attend people will not pay any heed or attention to such conferences when there are voluntary guidelines when a framework is being established to mandatorily implement such law only then we we'll think about it uh majid wada has covered the entire gamut as i mentioned two three times earlier but when i was preparing myself today in the morning you know it's been really occupied today in the morning only i was thinking what to speak uh you know because we generally don't speak on e and that too if you relate uh, e with the uh, cg which means corporate governance and sustainability uh then i thought you know the genesis of uh, e lies in our uh, ancient scriptures maybe gita maybe guru granth sahib and when i did my uh, prayers today in the morning i did prakash we have guru granth sahib at our place i somehow uh, you know coincidentally remembered and when we did prakash the the shabad at the okamnama which came was pavan guru pani pita mata dharma mahat i don't know how many of you have understood this majid madam was from ludhiana i'm sure she would have understood with the being a punjabi her self certainly may understand but others i really don't know but i'll try to explain pavan guru pavan means there here is our guru his teacher we worship here pavan guru pani water is a father mata dharat mahat so earth is the great mother pavan guru pani pita mata dharat mahat and uh, you know if you if you relate the esg and e from this perspective and in fact then i asked my colleague in my office who has been reading gita more than the law books because we are a lawyer so i come from a law firm so but she sent me some some chapters from gita where sorry specifically e is talked about verse 14 15 of chapter 3 we can thrive only if we offer back to nature verse 25 of chapter 5 achieve we achieve eternal bliss and we would be able to achieve it only when we perform our duties for the welfare of all beings now if we start discussing about the today's topic from this perspective and in fact uh, while i was on my way i thought uh, is this the only uh, shabad in guru granth sahib where uh, e is talked about then i realized no there are many more at least at least 10 uh, you know quotations are there with the importance of entire esg is also established so thank you vidhi you gave me this idea to find something on google you know i just googled it i i had put importance of environment in guru granth sahib importance of society in guru granth importance of governance in, and i got many uh, papers i got a uh, lot of information which i am certainly going to read and maybe share with my kids as well because we never related from that perspective uh, in fact uh, the entire Uh, theory of ESG, the way it is established now, the BRSR uh, reports. Uh, our institute also has taken this initiative. Rajit sir is here. He knows that uh, earlier worked with institute closely and on many initiatives. In BRSR, uh, when we discuss with SEBI, because SEBI is a close. Uh, ICSI has been a close connect of SEBI in many new initiatives. Our institute last year launched an award, which is called BRSR Award. I don't know how many of us are aware. And in the award, we have also introduced crash courses, new syllabus, also introduced about the ESG framework. And not only this, our Companies Act also talks about the duty of directors. you certainly in the times to come would be advisors to directors you certainly would be advising uh, many corporates and when we when we talk about advising corporates the importance of role of directors also comes 
you know director's duty is not to only earn profit if you see section 166 Uh, of the company that, and you won't believe I have read uh, company that more than uh, you know I have read any other law because being a company secretary lawyer and then did masters in law, company that has always been closest to my heart next to my wife. Uh, <laughs> although she is also a company secretary, so again one and one makes one hundred eleven maybe. <laughs> so, but when when I read company that, I never realize that. Uh, there is importance of e established in our company that as well when we when you see section 166 it talks about duties of directors now duties of directors obviously uh, involves centered to the the performance of direct performance a company is supposed to do but it talks about environment it talks about welfare of all in fact i noted uh, because i realized this today That when I read section one sixty six again, because half part of it deals with what we advise them. We advise them how to earn more profit, how to restructure your entities, how to uh, you know uh, drive the force into the corporate which we need. But then one sixty six subsection two of companies that also talks about work for benefit and in best interest of company employees, shareholders, community, and for protection of environment. It's there. It's provided, and I ask you when I am sure there are corporates here also who would be attending this program the whole day. You know, it's not only that the legislature intent is there; even the judiciary talks about it. Last year, a judgment was passed by Supreme Court, M K Ranjit Singh versus Union of India. They specifically talk talk about threat to a survival of a species. In Uttarakhand, a power transmission unit was laid down. The issue was whether it's the responsibility of a director, and let me tell you, responsibility of not the executive directors, even the independent directors. What's the role of independent directors? And that's how we talk about governance and sustainability. Because earning profit is easy by way of many shortcuts, but what we really need to look at is sustainability. And that's why conferences and workshops like these are very important. Because when we relate. With what is the legislative intent and what is the law being laid down? Because whatever Supreme Court otherwise clarifies. Now that specifically they say that that that's the director's duty. But when you look at the data, it doesn't relate. In fact, I was surprised to note that only 14 percent public sector entities. And I wonder why public sector entities and units are supposed to be more ESG governed than the private sector entities. Because private sector's intent would be to earn more, to deliver more, to give back more to its stakeholders, to give back more to people who have invested. In fact, investors' mindset have changed now. The ESG funding, which is a new buzzword. In fact, ESG funds are created where they look at ESG, all three elements of it, and they invest in corporates who have good rating, A rating, as we call it, ESG rating A. and in fact this esg risk assessments and insight limited acute ratings are few organizations where they are uh, rating uh, uh, corporates and other entities on esg compliance now when we talk about this i was surprised to see only 14% public sector entities are esg rating a plus and private sector 440 percent entities in the country R ESG rating A. So what it tells us? It tells us that you know charity begins from home. When we talk about this, even the public sector entities need to introspect. And who else? You know we are here. That's how we we'll all together make this change. And I think we are always there for. Uh, uh, you know I have to. I don't want to take too much of time. I can just say that this is a thought-provoking uh, workshop. I am sure in the entire day you will talk more on this aspect. There were at least ten quotes which I found in uh, Guru Granth Sahib on uh, E only, and I, from core of my heart, uh, with the thanks to you, that I read at least two, three of them. And while going back, certainly two days and off, I'll go back home after attending a meeting with a new client in office. I I end my address uh, with the thanks to Terry and thanks to NFCG and thanks. For you all to uh, bear my address, but certainly given an opportunity, would uh, love to come again, speak more on compliance, speak more on governance because that's our subject. 
but uh, certainly I land by saying that there is another quote when they talk about uh, in Guru Granth Sahib only Pavan Pani Dharti Akash. I'll repeat Pavan Pani Dharti Akash, Ghar Mandar Har Bani, Air, Water, Earth, Sky. Lord has made these homes as His temple, as His home and temple. So our role also we have to implement when we talk about ESG from corporate compliance perspective, governance and sustainability, we would be able to sustain, our next generation would be able to sustain only when we also contribute in whatever manner and we also think that this is the, uh, you know, this is our uh, duty to protect the monument and to implement this ESG true letter and spirit. Uh, that's all I can say for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much sir, for bringing such a unique perspective to the workshop today. Uh, and now I would like to invite Dr. Ritu Gupta, our next speaker. To all of you who are participating in this national workshop, eminent speakers in the panel, Dr. Vidhi, the coordinator. If there is again uh, Ms. Manjri, because she had some other engagement, so she stole the show and just left. And then uh, we had Chawla ji talking beautifully about uh, uh, you know those things for which you need elders to tell you that this is not something new. But this is which have always been part of our tradition, culture, custom, religion. ESG is such a relevant topic. And see what I liked about the topic. When they say that we have to focus on E in ESG and then we are free for our reflections. So making reflections is the best thing. If I have to reflect, why are we talking in terms of, I am not going to talk in terms of all those statistics which you are going to deliberate in the two sessions. We have paper presenters. If we think that why have we landed into this situation and if we have to, what is the legacy that we have to carry? You know, as a uh, Manjri it says she had been an academician and wants to be an academician in future and Chawla ji is also uh, holding the heart of a teacher. And here if I talk about being an academician and directly communicating to this young generation, the youth who actually beholds that energy that we need to conserve the energy. Daily in the classrooms, we have to touch the lives of those students who ultimately make that difference for that we are looking for. See, I teach law and the law students when they come and uh, Vidhi is going to agree. They want to be corporate lawyers. They want to be partners in the firm. They want to do company secretary also. But this is where we have told them and we have brought them. But again, something happens. Something happens there in Joshi Mat. Something happens in Turkey. And again, that morning we are going to just think about it and then forget in the quest of that money or that power or the kind of issues that we have to be for what we are running for. So, if you talk about my reflections on focusing on this environment and I'll just carry forward from where Mr. Chawla just left us and I'm also reminded of one, uh, uh, one episode many of you must have seen it somewhere on the TV or in, in Mahabharata when uh, Sri Krishna goes to uh, Draupadi when he is hungry and they are in exile and he asks for food. And there uh, Draupadi just shows him that empty utensil that I don't have anything, I am not left, we already had food, what, whatever we, uh, we could gather. And there Sri Krishna just tells her, just, and he'll just point out 
बस अन्न का एक दाना सुख देगा मुझको मन माना दिस इज हाउ एंड दिस टूडे वी आर वी आर विटनेसिंग दैट जी ट्वेंटी इंडिया इज चैंपियनिंग दैट कॉज एंड वसुधाई कुटुंबकम इज द इज द मेन कैप्शन और स्लोगन नहीं अगर हम भूलें तो दैट इज वसुधाई कुटुंबकम का जो मूल मंत्र विच ऑलरेडी वी हैड एवरीवेयर now we have to tell the world that this is what we require and i was wondering whether we can focus on e without focusing on s and g governance all these uh, uh, corporate people and everywhere you will talk about the director you will talk about the governance issues but what about the societal the the thing which pertains to social <coughs> can anyone just help me with what do we actually cover in that s in esg so that we can come back to reflections on e <coughs> what else sustainability sustainability and diversity yeah i think they are at the epitome something more tolerance yes this is what i was looking for inclusiveness can we just leave somebody behind and just march ahead that is the question that we need to flag today and identify the importance of inclusiveness if i just quote from i also thought see being one of the uh, speakers speaking after two eminent speakers has spoken you are actually not left with many things and neither the time nor the words but i'll still uh, uh, just bring to your uh, bring your attention to something which we have witnessed we witnessed cop 27 and if i just quote from what antonio gutres uh, that uh, he just managed to say the world still needs a giant leap on climate ambition and they say cop 20 uh, this was in the concluding remarks cop 27 concludes with much homework and little time the that clock which is ticking what do we need to go time to flick that green switch green not on paper green not only the color choice green has to be that option that we bring us to that sustainability for which we are looking for and we have traditionally always believed in that sustainability and this is just off late that we derailed or we just got uh, you know deviated from that motive with which we had started and if you see all these esg things these are so important but if you just go back because these are the part of sdgs right because it has emanated from there and if you see why that what was the guiding principle of those sdgs was if you read you'll find that it says leave no one behind and that's why this inclusiveness and when you just follow that what was the objective of these sdgs then you will see the importance of having this uh, theme for today's discussion on which we can have all those presentations what we see but you see we are here and uh, when you talk about mother earth nature needs some bailout what we have done uh, two news uh, two pieces of news that i just share and many of you must have read gaziabad court because we all come from that lawyer community and law and whatever happens to court rooms or judges we that fetches our attention and you see there is some leopard which has entered the court room and one reflection of an author how does how do philosophers and the authors and the writers they view that entry of that leopard he has visualized and he has mentioned that that leopard was there to get justice because nobody looked into what was our environmental protection act which year do you remember even ep it is 
how many years and have we actually able to bring those provisions of environmental protection act into practice there have been if i name those laws which have been there other than this environmental protection let's not talk big things but very very small things the issues pertaining to safari everybody wants to go to jim carbet jim carbet or any other safari we love but are we not encroaching upon their space and if they encroach upon them what is the problem i just don't know and we are actually racing against the time here in the conference to conclude this inaugural session as well as when you talk about maintaining all those standards with which which we actually want that we should have should can these are the words that we always remember remember when you were in schools there was something more that teachers used to tell you ought to how many of us actually remember that ought to think ought to is something which i don't know how do you just read it separately from should and this is what ought to be practiced or practiced or followed or whenever the opportunity comes we actually miss when the opportunity comes otherwise we'll just keep on talking before that or after that we'll just calculate but till the time you measure then how will you manage the things so managing requires measuring and if you measure the harm that you have actually done do we actually have something called as undo button in life computer mein to sab ke hota hai aaj kal but in real life whatever happens whatever time has gone by whatever actions have have actually hurt the ecology environment humans species or for that matter that climate change that we have been talking about or those agendas so 2030 is the next target i don't know how are we going to meet that target of 2030 also because we are already in 2023 and the situation is really scary but there are certain good things that keep on happening if you have read today's newspaper you'll see that some lithium is discovered why we are happy to discover that lithium <laughs> where are you going to use it electric vehicle so electric vehicle is going to be one of the norms so we have to grow but at we have to develop but at the same time we have to just carry out those activities and focus on those uh, practices that actually do not cause that dent which is irreparable like with this uh, uh, the way we just did this uh, uh, inauguration that sustainable inauguration dr vidhi just mentioned sustainable inauguration and all these plans every time they will guide you that this is the life and what we have been doing that will take away life from us howsoever we yearn for it howsoever we earn for it that will ultimately not help us and all these disclosure norms transparency things if you think sincerely we will do what our duty is so that balancing that we teach basically right comes along with duties so every time rather than talking in terms of those rights we have to think in terms of those duties those these days we do not have moral sciences classes right hamare zamane mein bachpan mein kuch kuch naitik shiksha padhate the and these days so your course curriculum has to inculcate those values may be related to environment may be related to constitution wonderfully created documents and we are celebrating that azadi ka amrit mahotsav and there again this young uh, this youth par you need to look back into why we had all those fundamental uh, uh, what you term as fundamental rights what you term as the powers of parliament to enact certain legislation specifically 
why we need to talk about those international conventions so all these things are very very important so i'll not just take i don't know i'll just disagree with what uh, uh, one of the speakers just mentioned about not disagree rather i just have my reflection because when you say holistic capitalism can actually we have something called as holistic capitalism we'll have to uh, you know take along everybody again that inclusive thing and all those things that we need to so that business responsibility and sustainability report of course is one uh, beckon and that's what we need to follow but the point is for this what we need to do no need to engage into those heroic actions we are not but we need to take baby steps all those small steps and and all those simple exercises will help us build that environment and will bring those kinds of sustainability that we have been asking for so just uh, one take away from this discussion that we need to have greener options making that greener choices maybe maybe will bring us closer and why we talk in terms of consumer behavior because consumer behavior changes with time we have made smartphones now smartphones have made us smarter and we have access to all that information which we didn't have but along with exercising those smarter options what we need to what we don't the baggage that we don't need to carry with us the uh, obsolete practices that we need to abandon and the uh, what in term again as smarter or better or clearer or greener options that we need to carry forward so thank you so much and i take pride in again sharing with you that dr vidhi has been at some point of time my student also but it's good to see your your students growing and uh, you know becoming academician and now i am very sure she will be a wonderful teacher the way she has been a wonderful student and just one last Uh, that one point five degree reminder. If we just have that in our planner, I think that will help all of us. Thank you so much for having invited me here. Thank you. My best wishes for the uh, success of this national workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this session. You spoke like a true professor with your like examples and illustrations. We now have Mr. Sri Prakash with us. Distinguished Fellow Dairy for his session. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Good morning. In fact, uh, I am the only person here who is rather illiterate about the ESC. I didn't know about this. Uh, this first this term, first time I heard about a year ago. And uh, at this stage of my life, normally I don't like the new terms. I don't want to learn them. And uh, few days back, when Vidhi mentioned to me that uh, I have attended this seminar, I agreed immediately. But uh, then I realized that it will, it is, a, it is going to be Saturday, and then I didn't like it <laughs> because at least Saturday, Sunday should be mine. Anyway, I am here, and I am very happy that uh, to to learn more about the ESG, about the environment. Uh, environment uh, in dairy and dairy science, we keep on talking about all the day, and uh, sometimes uh, we feel elated, sometimes we feel grim, and sometimes we think it looks like that everything is lost. But again, uh, the, the uh, at the people, my friends, etc., when we talk uh, among ourselves. Then basically, it is like the people, some few people, senile people are talking about, 
and we all uh, agree that uh, the world is going to end very soon. But when I come to the uh, and then sit with the students here, and that is only uh, the reason that I come to the university, and then because that that is the way I can escape with the serenity. <laughs> I don't become sad only because when I see the that the what we talk about among ourselves, you don't you don't even mention about that. So that is something different. And then I see hopes in your eyes, and then and uh, the uh, Professor Gupta talked about the environment, and uh, she advised that uh, let us in this conference we talk about the E more than anything else. I agree with her because uh, what I have seen in my life is that environment and industry they don't gel together. If you have industry, then there will be water body nearby, which will be full of the pollutants. And uh, all of us have uh, seen it. And uh, in the initial year, uh, years of my career, uh, because I was a civil servant, it, um, I spent my time in the coal towns. And then the polluted air there, it was taken as granted and uh, we didn't uh, even hope that the this and then those, those uh, cities have not changed that is still as polluted as they were there in the 70s or late 80s now when i listened to mr chavla that <coughs> the private sector because uh, we are from that era where the private sector was hated. We all, <laughs> we all thought about the public sector, you know, because the government is to take all the responsibilities. Now in this new public management, where the private sector is to take over from the public, and when he says that private sector is doing better, well, uh, sometimes I don't like to believe him, but, <laughs> But if it is true, then it is really a matter of elation. If the private sector is realizing that it is their responsibility, because the uh, I have not been on the board of the private sector, uh, uh, the, but on the public sector board I have, and my experience on those board have not been very. <laughs> the, because the way the board functions and the board takes decision has not been very happy. But anyway, the coming back to the the ESG, the and in today's uh, topic of interest, I don't want to speak much. I wanted to speak much, but now we already we have the, uh, the next uh, the panel discussion, uh, the eleven fifteen it was scheduled. We have already taken a lot of time, and then. I think now I should stop and then uh, at the end uh, I am quite happy that uh, the and uh, that I have been I have come to the this on Saturday despite my reluctance and I have learnt a lot from Mr. Chawla and uh, Manjari and of course Professor Gupta. Thank you very much. I try to be brief. <laughs>
but so word of thanks you know, cannot be kept brief because a lot of hard work uh, has gone into what we see today. So this is a time to acknowledge the contribution of all the visible and the invisible hands that joined together for this uh, effective organization of the event that we see today. I start with my gratitude towards the member of the illustrious panel of uh, the inaugural session. Ms. Manjari Chaudhary has been at Sensia, Professor Ritu Gupta, Mr. N. P. S. Chavla, Sri Prakash Ji for sparing their invaluable time and incisive insights on the theme, which surely has set the tone for sessions to follow. The workshop could only see the light of the day due to the grant that we received from National Foundation for, for Corporate Governance. I express sincere appreciation towards the representatives of NSCG for seamless coordination of this event. I also extend my heartfelt gratitude towards all the panelists, session chairs, co-chairs and moderators. I already see few of them here, like all, all of them who will be joining us for panel one, Dr. Ranjit, uh, Dr. Navjeet, uh, uh, Ms. Vanita and I take the liberty of uh, uh, saying uh, Mr. Arupin in the end because he is my colleague at Tel, who will be making uh, it during the day of the workshop. I am sure that the knowledge and expertise will add immense value to the day's discourse. Um, a special thank you to all the paper presenters and participants for their overwhelming response and presence which undoubtedly instilled a lot of sense of confidence in us. I would also like to thank my Vice Chancellor, Professor Pratik Sharma, who had to be here, but owing to a bereavement in his family, he could not make it to the inaugural session. My deans had colleagues for being incessant source of encouragement. I further place on record uh, the support extended by the administrative team at Terisas, the registrar IT team comprising of Ms. Sonika, Torres, uh, Jatpreet, Pooja, Rajesh, Akhilesh, Shuman Bhaiya, whom you will see all across uh, for their unstinting support. The organizing team comprising of Ms. Himvati, is she here? Ms. Muskan, Ms. Shivangi, Ms. Neeti, Mr. Sufyan in, and Mr. Paratosh, which have been, who have been like pillars on which I would build this edifice. A big thank you to all the student volunteers who would make it to today for effective managing, effectively managing this event. Thank you all. Hope you all enjoy the day's proceeding. Thank you. Corporations in addressing environmental concerns has become more crucial than ever. This has brought to the forefront the importance of environmental disclosures and standardization in corporate governance. Our esteemed panel today includes Ms. Vanita Bhargava, partner at Kathan and Go. Can I please request Vidhi Imam to present her with the award? Dr. Ranjit Krishnan, Assistant Professor and Head of Academic Program Unit and Industry Liaison Officer at the National Institute of Security and Markets. And Mr. Arupendranath Nolik, Vice President of the Terry Council for Business Sustainability and a member of the National ESG Advisory Committee at SEBI. Our moderator for today's discussion is Dr. Navreet, Navjeet Sidhu, Assistant Professor at Guru Gobind Indra Prastha University. Today's 
panel discussion aims to shed light on how corporations can effectively integrate environmental disclosures into their governance framework and the steps that can be taken towards standardization in this area. Our esteemed panel will share their insights and experiences on this critical topic and we hope to gain valuable knowledge and ideas from their perspectives. I'll now hand it over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with the First of all, I would like to uh, extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Dr. Vidhi Madan Chadda, the National Foundation for Public Governance, for having me here. Uh, it's a very pertinent and important issue uh, that has caught global attention, the E in ESG. So as we discuss the E part of ESG and look at how corporate governance can actually give us answers to integrate environmental social governance disclosures in the way companies are reporting these days. There are two watershed moments that come to my mind. India being the leader in making corporate responsibility mandatory for a particular set of corporates in the year 2013. And the second watershed moment that comes to my mind is SEBI leading the country into bringing business responsibility and sustainability reporting and making it mandatory for the top thousand companies by market capitalization in the, from the year 2020, April 1st, 2020. So that is the time when actually uh, it was a policy driven initiative that led the country to think about reporting on ESG metrics. While the other part of the world, it's the other way around. The prerogative to decide or to lead the industry to report on these ESG disclosures came not from the policy but from the institutional investors in countries like in jurisdictions like US and UK. But in India, we do not have an ecosystem as such yet, so it's a work in progress. So what we are doing is there's a policy push and then the corporates are made to think about reporting on ESG metrics. So uh, we are almost not even uh, one year into it, and but. Uh, from the initial reports, what is coming out is that whatever little reporting has been done, there is a lot that has been found wanting. Lack of in-depth disclosures on climate risks, lack of standardization in reporting, lack of benchmarks, so we cannot compare how one industry is doing with respect to the other. So these are some of the very, very critical and challenging questions that are seeking answers. Why we are not here to provide answers, but let me lay out some of the issues there and let us try to seek solutions, right? So I'm very lucky to be moderating this panel. Uh, we have a blend of industry, academia and policy makers amongst us. So my first question to the panel is, what are the current challenges in promoting standardization and transparency in environmental disclosures in corporate governance and how can these be overcome? Thank you, Namjit. Thank you, Vidhi, and NFC for having us. Uh, so, uh, it, now, as far as E in the ESG is concerned, so, in terms of the environmental statutes that have been, uh, you know, on the books since 1981 from Air Pollution, Water Pollution Act, the Marine Protection Act, there have been uh, systems and processes provided for disclosure as such. Now, the move towards ESG reporting in BRSR is more towards directing capital towards sustainable uh, companies as such. So, uh, from all the three factors I feel at E in any event, we had a system of uh, disclosure and now it is, uh, so, so far as what the companies are doing at present, it is easy to gather information from already available sources with the company and uh, what the BRSR guidance documents also provide, you can cross reference. But, uh, but the challenge is when you come to disclosing, for example, the general disclosure requires as to uh, uh, long-term impact uh, and there's a vague requirement indicating material responsible business conduct and sustainability issues pertaining to environmental and social matters. 
and when it comes to what you are going to do more about GHG emissions, there is a weakness and there needs to be more clarity because it could lead to either uh, you know under promising or over promising and which could uh, lead to either the capital going away which is not good for the industry or it could lead to greenwashing which is not good for the economy. So there needs to be more clarity in so far as disclosures are concerned regarding what the company needs to do in the future. Uh, and of course like you said that even uh, uh, the guidance document it provides that you can choose, the companies can choose from various reporting frameworks, not, I mean, BRS gives a guidance document, but they say if you're already reporting in different frameworks, so again, that would obviously not lead to uh, a common standard. And that leads to, you know, the comparisons between uh, the companies becomes uh, difficult. Uh, and uh, th then there are many other, like, uh, so, some standards are created around uh, stakeholders' interests, uh, like GRI standards, and TFCT is, uh, TFCT is centered on climate change risk, SAP standards seek disclosure of issues. So, there are various standards which deal, uh, cater to different uh, stakeholders. And uh, and also is the problem of how the information is to be integrated. There is too much data, and uh, like I said, uh, there are certain, uh, you know, there's a thought that E is more important considering the climate uh, crisis that we face. Bundling everything together is also creating an issue as to how to then, you know, uh, fathom uh, the analysis from the data that is being given. And uh, one example is that, uh, you know, th there was a <coughs> article that I read about uh, how Tesla was given a lower rating than Exxon Mobil, even though they are making electric cars, mainly because, you know, S in their factor, the rating was low. And uh, so we need to have a, a certain standardized uh, committee. There, uh, some, uh, there has been a move by, uh, you know, the International Standards uh, for Financial Reporting Organization to frame, to bring about certain uniformity. So there needs to be a push for uniformity of standards. Yeah. Thank you. At the outset, uh, let me thank NFCG, Terry and Terry for uh, giving me an opportunity here to speak on the e-factor. Also thanking Vidhi for giving a session before lunch <laughs> because we are low faculty members and we have the dubious recognition of speaking while others are sleeping. So thank you Vidhi for uh, giving me an opportunity before lunch. So there are two panelists, Madam and uh, Mr. Malik, who is going to speak from a regulatory perspective as well as from the SEBI perspective, BRSR and all. So let me give an academy a touch probably on this key fact. Out of 26 alphabets, the alphabet E has created a revolution so far, twice. One because of electronic, we have e-commerce, we have e-filing, we have other electronic revolutions, etc. And now another E has come in the form of NVO. But what we have to understand here is, particularly in India, you know, the same thing has happened when it came to, came to CSR. India is probably one among the few countries where we call corporate social responsibility. In all other country, countries, it is called as social responsibility. Many a times we have to add a corporate tag or we have to come out with a regulation. So when ideal things are not followed voluntarily, it becomes a prescription. Take the case of a patient. You know, we have a lot of uh, good habits which we can imbibe. And when we are not imbibing it, probably we are asked to follow 
in the form of a prescription. Doctor will give us a prescription. He will ask us a lot of tests like that, you know, like BRSR, long schedules and all are there. Why? We waited till such time to make it a regulation. Again, what we have to understand is, even today, in the regime of regulation also, we are trying to understand more about e-regulations and less about e. We are trying to understand more about e-regulations. We are interested in knowing about, uh, you know, 2011 BRR, 2021 BRSR, market capitalization which are the top companies you know our thinking is going in that direction only regulations open the website of sebi rbi or other regulator or ministry of corporate affairs and see what changes are happening in the area of e so we are more regulatory centric unfortunately rather than understanding what is the concept of e you might have heard about a very famous Sanskrit verse, Loka Samastha Sugino Bhavantu. Recently when I went to an organization, I heard that the sloka is chanted in a different manner. Samastha Loka Sugino Bhavantu. Instead of Loka Samastha Sugino Bhavantu, I heard Samastha Loka Sugino Bhavantu. Something which I have learned from my school days, from my mother, from my teachers, I immediately asked after the talk, why it is called Samastha Loga Subhino So he said, it is not that we want the people to be happy and contented. We want first the world itself, the universe at large to be happy and contented. Then it comes to people. We speak about PPP model, right? What is that? People. Planet and profit. Today we have come to such an extent where we have to interchange the role. First we have to think about planet, <laughs> then only people. Correct. Imagine what has happened in Syria and Turkey. Imagine what is happening in some of the states of India. If you look at Kerala, if you look at Kerala, last four years, maybe from 2016, every year flood. I'm from Kerala. I never heard about flood during my school days, during my college days. But in the last four years, every year during monsoon season, there is a flood. What is the reason? It is we forgot to understand what E order. Or it is we forgot to realize what S is all about. G is much far. No need of thinking about G only. Don't take it to the extent of G. Don't take it to the extent of G. Because when we speak about governance, it becomes a process. So I would like to say that the word E is to be imbibed and not injected. Unfortunately, we are in an injecting regime. You will agree with me. BRSR or former BRR, market capitalization. You know, it's more of a procedural formality. I should not tell, but you know, law professors, we speak about compliance and we bifurcate it, triple A model compliance. Apparent compliance, adequate compliance, and absolute compliance. When we speak about absolute compliance, there is no scope for governance there. Why we should be governed? That is the first question I must ask. Why we, we must be governed? Before a governance approach comes, let us understand that. Act. So that is. One thing which uh, I would like to tell you. So try to understand environment in particular and not environmental regulations. And it should start within. 
I am representing National Institute of Securities Market and Educational uh, Institution of SEBI. All the discussions about BRSR used to happen in our campus. The first thing which we did before having a series of uh, discussions or brainstorming sessions and all was to make our campus a green campus. Today we are green campus. You will not find plastic. It's a plastic bag campus. It's a solar driven campus. So in all aspects. So the regulator said that if we are regulating somebody, first of all, it should start with us. Same thing happening in SEBI also. You will be knowing that you will be visiting SEBI. Perfect. Look at Kochi there. The only airport which is 100% solar driven. No other airport in the world. You know, many advanced countries also. If you look at Japan, if you look at Germany also, you know, people used to misunderstand. Kochi means uh, the Japan Kochi. There is one Kochi in Japan also. It's not that. It's our own Kochi in the state of Kerala, which is considered as a green airport. Now, if you look at what is happening in our country when it comes to environment, you know, I am not getting into overpopulation and all those things. There are at least six old conventional traditional rivers which are extinct today, which is not there. If you go to those places, probably your tourist guide will tell you that there was a river here. I can at least tell two rivers immediately. One is Bharatapuda. There is a river called Bharatapuda. Today you will find only an overprints, but not a river. There is a place called Chitravati in Andhra Pradesh. The river is used for drying clothes now. Not even a drop of water except during the monsoon season. Why? The awareness which will be more useful in implementing E to a greater extent. Thank you so much. Sorry, 7 billion US dollars were raised as ESG funds. The year before that, uh, it was uh, 1.4 billion uh, US dollars, and which was you know uh, which was a fair, you know a time when you know the, the market was just you know uh, coming out of the, the COVID you know, the, the COVID panic. And but before the the pandemic in in 2019, uh, the the aggregate ESG funds that were that were raised, all this is in Indian market, was around 4.5 billion USD. We see that you know this, the you know uh, what what Vanita ji was also mentioning about the you know, the need for standardization. That becomes more and more important because you know if. If we are saying that the you know the, the fresh capital that will be infused into the into the market that will be responsible for the, the economic growth that we are looking at, if that needs to be ESG compliant, then we will need you know a standardized uh, you know a standardized uh, methodology to look at the right kind of taxonomy to be uh, to be used for uh, for ESG. There needs to be clarity and pretty much. You know, an analogy can be also drawn from the credit rating because you know, today you just you know uh, see a certificate that it is a you know A plus, so you, you know that okay, so which means you know so I would assume, and then you know kind of you know you then uh, delve into. 
the we see that the esg journey is, is also going in in the, that that direction uh, you you talked about you know you know climate change uh, uh, the earlier session the, the speakers also you know talked about you know what has you know emanated out of the the cop twenty the cop twenty seven now an important part again you know which which uh, you know emphasizes is the the cover if you look at the cover de decision of cop twenty seven at Sharm El Sheikh uh, that talks about the need for the the financial systems to be transformed and transformed like never ever uh, done. And that is important because you know the uh, 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 pretty much the 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 examples that you know, uh, that sir is also mentioning that you know the you know why not we you know uh, preach let's practice and that would mean that you know the the financial world would need to understand you know, uh, the matrices to scrutinize a, a proposal. Uh, which is you know uh, uh, which is you know environmental friendly environmentally oriented than uh, than otherwise uh, a proposal if, if it if it is about green buildings if it is about you know the you know building a building a you know, a Cochin Cochin airport you know with the with a platinum rated you know uh, certificate what differently needs to be uh, needs to be you know looked at while you know determining the uh, you know determining the, the you know the, the viability of, of such a project, and it had a very important development in this uh, in this this entire uh, discourse has been the the inter, the uh, the international uh, the the international sustainability standards board coming into in the COP twenty COP twenty six in Glasgow, and you know the, the first anniversary was was celebrated at Sharm El Sheikh with the launch of two draft standards and these standards what we are increasingly seeing is geographies after geographies markets after markets they are adopting these standards and you know in the and that including you know uh, SEBI is is positively uh, positively looking at that because please understand that SEBI's uh, work is you know is, is, is global in nature the work is aligned with the uh, with the international organization for securities commission and that has uh, the iosco has adopted uh, 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 the issb uh, issb standard and now this gets percolated into into the uh, into the, the each each markets across across world geographies Thank you. Actually, uh, I needed to uh, understand from you. SEBI had a uh, march of the committee in 2021, looking at standardization. So, were you part of that? I. Yeah. 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 All right. So, uh, so uh, the committee actually looked into lack of uh, standardization and also how the rating agencies they're not doing the kind of role that is expected of them. So, uh, if you could throw a light on that. Sir. Sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, SEBI has a uh, you know has had constituted this, uh, this this committee with a particular interest to you know look at the ESG ESG ratings, and uh, you know the and I must you know uh, you know mention the you know the uh, how Madhuriji who is the, the SEBI chairperson. You know, how she she is enthused and you know uh, she, she has super zip that you know to, to make that make that difference. Now what is uh, you know what kind of you know uh, triggered the SEBI to have this committee and to you know uh, evaluate this uh, you know these ESG ratings are you know the example that that you are talking about uh, you know Tesla is uh, you know so so from a distance you are then seeing that you know Exxon Mobil has got a you know in a higher higher rating and uh, this this has not. Interestingly, what, what I have read that most of the high polluting industries, they are very favorably rated by these rating agencies. Yeah, yeah. So, so, in, so these rating agencies, you know, be it MSCI, uh, be it Sustain Analytics, uh, be it Bloomberg, you know, they would have, uh, why they would? They already have a you know, methodology, which is kind of a black box for the world. 
because you know they they would keep this close to their heart you know share share with the world but we kind of to kind of value that you know some of these uh, you know rating agencies globally have you know they would they would be very easy to you know uh, influence the mindset of the regulators the shareholders the investors the new investors because the new investors would also you know look at some of those references to you know start the the conversation why you know this is uh, why the uh, the example that you took exon mobile versus versus tesla now please understand that the the esg uh, it 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 works on a exclusionary principle the esg uh, ratings and today fossil fuels is not an exclusionary item and which is why you know in a in a esg portfolio if you you know start you know scrutinizing if some of the students are interested in that if they you know, scrutinize the, the portfolios you would still find you know uh, exon mobil you will still find the total still find the shell in those those portfolios and it is essentially because this is the exclusionary principle now the exclusionary principle what does it exclude then if, if it is not excluding fossil fuels so it excludes you know uh, gambling it excludes you know weapons for mass destruction it excludes adult uh, entertainment it excludes uh, you know um, uh, 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 money money uh, laundering but it does not exclude fossil fuel and till that time that this changes you would still find that you know some mining, of this mining energy and uh, automobile industries uh, yeah yeah and the specific example that you that you do can if you you know look through or if, you know any anyone interested would look through what is really happening is a uh, is a is a value chain uh, impact and which is where you know the the, the uh, e of esg is not a, a gate to gate approach so it is a value chain approach what is happening is you know and uh, and the vidhi ji also talked about the news item today that we have found new lithium and it is this particular reason where tesla got bit up because the namibia uh, mining it was reported that there is there is child labor issues and they they got significant beating uh, beating on that and which is why i am saying that you know the need for you know the the financial world you know because you know the hard reality is you know that is the you know the, the wall street uh, kind of you know uh, uh, you know uh, pushes pushes that and for the wall street to look at some of these issues so i have been fortunate to also engage with some of the you know the in the You know, the investors and the movers and shakers in in Wall Street, and in New York, we had a, we had actually done an, an engagement there to exhibit that you know ESG you know together makes sense for them to look at this as a as a, as a decision making criteria. Believe you me, the Wall Street today is hungry. The Wall Street today is hungry to understand, and. where you know the the role of you know all of us and you know these budding minds come in is to develop matrices which is which is aligned to the to the global framework it it should have a global appeal but it should nudge this this change of thinking from you know how the decisions are made today to how you know including some of these uh, esg issues the decision should be made and that would be the the key mm-hmm. thank you so uh, key takeaways from uh, this round of discussion is that uh, first uh, as sir has said indeed sir and uh, beautifully he has pointed out that e is to be imbibed and not injected it should not be a procedural formality for the companies to just uh, go about reporting and you know looking at tick boxing those e e s metrics absolute compliance leaves no questions for corporate governance so if you want if you don't want them to uh do tokenism just let give them that free hand and and build the culture where they actually voluntarily disclose all and uh, my next question is uh, to vanita ma'am uh, from an industry perspective since you're coming from uh how can corporate boards 
impel uh, ESG to solutions. So, um, like I said, that uh, even under the companies have been prior to DLS, DLSR being uh, mandatory, there was always a provision to uh, disclose material events, you know, anything which is going to affect. So, as far as, uh, you know, as far as what was, so we were always in a reactive regime. So, corporate boards had to, in any case, if there was any accident or if there was any uh, notices issued by the authorities. It was anyways mandatory for them to report and they had to also uh, submit an environment statement, etc. Uh, now when it comes to what uh, Mr. Uh, Ranjit was also saying, that now we are moving towards a more proactive regime. So while, you know, uh, maybe uh, we have moved too fast towards a mandatory regime, although there has been some time given for that, but till the time, the boards imbibe it and they actually obviously have to have experts on board who can point out that whatever their activities are, are going to lead to a certain consequence on the uh, environment. Till that time, the boards will, uh, you know, will, will not really be, will have a meaningful discussion. The boards also basically are dealing with uh, the fact that uh, of on long term, on short term impacts. Even when the requirements are also to uh, put in long term impacts, and that is where, uh, you know, they, in the long term, maybe an industry might seem a bit clean uh, in the short term. But what about the long term? So, so therefore, uh, when it comes to uh, boards, I think one, they can incorporate ESG audits, uh, just like financial audits. And, uh, uh, they, they need to obviously engage with the technology experts because they are the ones who will be able to really gather the consequences of any action. For example, a technology firm may seem very clean. I mean, there's a, there was also an article that Amazon is just making warehouses. So they actually encroached on farmland and uh, that is leading to destruction of habitat. So, uh, whereas, you know, uh, we only see the fossil fuel, we, we only see on paper the fossil fuel companies. So, boards, in order to be more proactive, they first need to have the right kind of people on the board to give the right kind of training and, uh, of course, in, engage in uh, reviews. Uh, uh, and because, like, uh, what the disclosures are basically asking that you show that whether you have a policy, and it's like, like you said, it's just a tick box. And what are you doing? Are you monitoring and how far have you reached? Uh, is, do you have a system of monitoring the policy? That is all they ask. What, how much, and it's very difficult to quantify also uh, in terms of rupees and how far, uh, you know, you have uh, reached your goals in minimizing fossil fuel or uh, adopting uh, best practices. Uh, so yes, the, firstly the boards need to be more uh, hands-on by the right thing. So the real push actually has to come from the boards. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we delve into our next question uh, for the panel. And the question is, uh, what role do stakeholders, including investors, regulators and the public, play in advancing the implementation of effective environmental disclosure practices in the corporate sector. Yeah, yes, uh, so as far as the stakeholders, investors, regulators and public are concerned, uh, so uh, investors uh, obviously uh, now with more information, I mean ESG obviously is playing a very important role in seeing the, uh, you know, basically bringing into light and bringing into one place uh, what is going to affect uh, their uh, investment decisions. and uh, So they should seek information depending on the pro products uh, of funding. So whether it is uh, impact funding or, uh, so based on that, uh, you know, th that would dr drive the disclosure requirements as well. Uh, regulators, of course, should make the disclosure simple. For example, uh, I understand that we need a push because we are still not a proactive, uh, you know, corporate, and the regime is still reactive. 
So they, but they should make the disclosure simple and frame uh, common standards based on industry and region. There has to be some sort of a study that for such industries these disclosure uh, requirements are necessary because many a times it becomes a very bureaucratic way for the corporates itself. Corporate, the main uh, grievance of the corporates is just that they have to have a separate department just to fulfill all the compliances, which may not be a very uh, good argument in the court uh, that it is cumbersome, but uh, so the, the, uh, the dis this needs to be more simplified and it needs to be in a manner where data can be just uh, picked up from uh, right now it is all bundled. So that also creates an issue in analysis, uh, I feel. And of course, public in India, public has always been the driving factor, when, uh, especially in the 80s when the public interest litigation was introduced by the courts. That has driven most of our environmental regulation. It is only from the push by the by vigilant uh, NGOs, etc., who have taken a lot of issues to the court and who have given a push. So even now, with more information being in their hands, in any case, envi for environment law, disclosure was a very important issue. That's why we have public hearings as well for in, you know brand of environment clearances. Now, with the quality of disclosure <coughs> firstly becoming uh, better by the corporates driving it, secondly, you know, by streamlining the disclosure requirements itself so that anybody can pick up and any uh, stakeholder can understand that data. Right now, the data may be understood by investors and uh, you know, maybe regulators to a certain extent, but uh, so that can help them to ask for more pertinent information and also it will help them to follow. Uh, As the audience today are going to talk about, uh, you know, what role corporate should play, she was also asking about board. Two, three things I would like to throw some light because since you are, most of you are from law background, most of you are from MBA background, I want all of you to go through the Gadgil report and Kasturi Rangan report. Have you heard about these two reports, any of you? Gadgil report and Kasturi Rangan report. And you know what has happened in Kasturi Rangan report. It is with regard to 44 districts of the country which is falling in the Western Guards, right? Western Guards. And what has happened when it comes to Gadgil report? Gadgil report has clearly told that there are three dams which cannot be utilized as dams considering the ecological situation or eco balance or whatever it is. Corporates could not follow, they pressurized the government, brought another report which Minimize the, the impact of Gadgil report. Unfortunate to tell. The other day I was interacting with uh, one of the scientists of a leading Ayurvedic medicine manufacturing company. Number one, leading means number one medicine manufacturing Ayurvedic company. He said in the last three years, Sir, we have discontinued 18 products. I asked why. That is because of the effect of deforestation. We are unable to get the herbs. See the effect. Or see the consequences of effect. And let me also tell you, I was talking about extinct of rivers. You know, something... I don't know how many of you can imagine what I am telling. I can imagine because I have seen that. I have seen both these rivers. <coughs> you know what is the reason particularly in the state of Kerala and Tamil Nadu? Rampant soil extraction was there for many many years. I remember way back in 2001, one truck full of soil which is extracted from the river was costing 75,000 rupees. Price, bribe, whatever it is. And 2001 government came with a rule that no more soil extraction from 
we have started witnessing the impact of the previous soil extraction 16 years down the line in 2016. So environment is considered to be the most patient element. Its patience is for a very long time and moment it loses the patience we are seeing. Correct. Many of the environmental scientists and who fight for the protection are against this Maiban technology. But now if you go to this, uh, uh, what do you say, extended part of New Delhi or NCR, you can find many towers coming. I think only up to 20 floors. In Bombay, we have up to 72 stories building. 72 storey building. Up to 10th floor, crows and all will come. From 12th floor onwards, our companions are eagles and vultures. Vultures inside the house. So we speak about banning of this uh, my one technology for whatsoever may be the reason. It is not an ideal technology. But here, Many builders are propagating the concept of Maiwan technology. And huge buildings are coming, particularly in a place like Delhi, which is prone for earthquakes. I think every two weeks, some mild earthquake is coming. You know, it is reported at least once in a month in Delhi, to my understanding. It is very mild. But we don't know when it is going to be another Syria. We don't know, unfortunately. When it is going to be another Turkey or whatever it is. If you look at, look at places like Bombay and all, they are prone to two risks. One is earthquake and the other one is because of the sea effect. Here earthquake only. Their floods are also expected any time. What is the reason? We speak about this climatic change. I think the, why I am telling all these things is to create an awareness because you are going to be the real drivers of uh, environment. You are going to be the real beneficiary of environment. And you are going to be the real sufferers of environment if you are not taking care of that uh, effect. You know, we all spoke about uh, the LPG liberalization, privatization and globalization and it has really boosted uh, our economy when we were in such a bad shape way back in 1991. But while that LPG has given us lot of benefits to boost our uh, you know standard of living, purchasing power, employment and all those things. See one thing which LPG has unfortunately gifted to us, that is the Kodaikanal Mercury case. I don't know whether you have heard about it. Such a beautiful land, Kodaikanal. See how people are suffering even today. A business which was banned in a developed country was brought here. We talk about carbon footprints. I'm sure that uh, you know most of. I'm sure that you all know about carbon footprints. Why subcontinent is considered to have more carbon footprints? Because in subcontinent, all the developed nations have invested and made it a manufacturing hub. And when it is a manufacturing hub, it is bound to have more more carbon footprints. Then. I would also invite your attention to another episode, the endosulfan case, as well as the Plachimada debacle, where Coca Cola had to fight a tough battle. I think you should travel in all these routes and understand. You know, I think. Uh, as a person who is going to take care of E in the days to come, rather than understanding what to do, you must have a clear idea of what you should not do. 
So leaving my thoughts here to take it forward, to take the baton ahead, is stop. Ever since the you know the net zero uh, computation has been uh, has has come into the fore, and the Prime Minister has given a call that by 2017 India should be a net zero. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and globally also you know uh, industries are you know moving towards you know declaring their uh, declaring their goals. But if you look at you know and, and these data that the disclosures that happen are of course you know assured uh, assured data. Uh, twenty twenty one and uh, twenty twenty uh, these two years you know, the the number of you know uh, uh, you know statements of correction that were submitted to to CDP were uh, spiked spiked up because. You know, for making a uh, making a you know uh, making such a such a such a declaration uh, and the, the computation that needs to be done at the back end, all of that had to be had to be recalculated to you know establish those those pathways and environmental you know disclosures you know definitely you know provide uh, or you know calls for more credibility. Uh, more calls for more attention to the, to the details while uh, the environmental disclosures are of the uh, uh, you know uh, are there, and increasingly you know uh, we, we are also seeing that you know in terms of the assurance, uh, you, know, you know the the journey from you know say limited assurance to a reasonable assurance. Is increasingly getting faster, which also that you know determines the, the environmental disclosures. And the third and the last thing that environmental disclosures you know play is is an is a and there is a live example sitting in the, the audience. Uh, environmental disclosures you know provide confidence to the internal stakeholders. And we have a colleague from a oil and gas major here today. Who is an alumni of uh, you know, uh, Teddy Sass, and he would vouch that you know these trends of year-on-year -year, you know, data does help the, the management to look at you know uh, to look at positively to some of the some of the proposals that are being you know uh, that are being placed to the board uh, for for consideration because they, you know, at the end the board would say that uh, uh, net zero have you done anything? So this year-on-year -year, you know, environmental disclosures then provides the foundation for that, that conversation to happen, for that engagement to happen. And to, you know, for the, the board to also have a confidence that you know, it is not a, you know, uh, a, a sudden thought that chalo, kal, but it is a it is progressive action that has happened. Thank you so much, ma'am and sirs. Uh, well, the panel touched upon a gamut of issues. Uh, uh, Varita ma'am highlighted the role that the boards can play, uh, the lack of standardization, how instead of making it mandatory, push should come from within. Ranjit sir again brought, uh, brought, brought into uh, picture a lot of examples ranging from the drying up of the riverbeds to uh, the depletion of environment to bring home the point that E in ESG is always more important and if you focus on E, the S and G is going to follow. And Anupendra sir, uh, for your view from the policy perspective that 
how feedback from stakeholders is crucial and how even uh, standardization push is uh, being done from the side of SEBI also. And again, you are also making a case for uh, greater disclosures uh, coming from public, asking uh, the, the call for greater disclosures coming from public and other stakeholders and how if the public is pushing for greater dis uh, uh, disclosures, then it can nudge the company boards to push for progress action on an IMG front. So thank you so much uh, for your valuable time and uh, now we are open for questions. Students language. Understanding environmental regulations directly without understanding environment is as bad as thinking about attendance shortfall without attending classes. <laughs> you have no intentions of attending classes, but you are ready with the rules and regulations of what is the shortfall. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, so we're open for questions from the audience. So I just wanted to know, you mentioned about CDP and ECFD, uh, so I just, uh, only CDP, but I really wanted to know uh, where do you Thank you. So I just really wanted to know where do you see uh, disclosures like CDP, TCFD coming in India? Because right now like I did a little study myself. So I just realized that it's just coming into the picture now. And it's and I went through multiple uh, reports and I realized that it's very uh, preliminary in nature. Very nascent. Very nascent. Uh, like when they talk about climate risks like uh, even Sir was mentioning. Uh, it's all, and also like Ma'am was mentioning, uh, they are only looking at short-term impacts. They're not really talking about long-term impacts because it's difficult to follow up on that. So how can government help with uh, these kind of studies and research that is required to really understand climate risks and put them into the business strategy? TCFD, the GRI will continue to be, uh, be voluntary. And uh, this this won't become uh, you know mandatory uh, mandatory at all uh, because you know these entities are you know independent entities and you know the the, the government you know not just India but elsewhere as well will will not adopt them. Uh, what will happen is and what has al also happened if you look at you know the, the earlier SEBI notifications. They have mentioned the, uh, you know, mentioned or, you know, uh, mentioned GRI, uh, GRI standards, the integrated reporting framework as, as preferred, you know, choice and recommended, you know, items. Uh, in practice, what essentially, you know, happens is, you know, any, any industry will, will actually not wait for a government mandate to, you know, start considering to report on, on CDP or on, on, on GRI. Because you know, that this is largely driven by the investor community. These are largely driven by the global supply chain. So, you know, even if, uh, uh, so, so, so for example, you know, even if there is, you know, you would, you would find a report that, you know, uh, you know, Tesla's lithium uh, mining in Namibia has just got a you know a red red flag, but you will still find that you know the the, <coughs> market, uh, the one uh, you know uh, uh, one shop floor where you know carpet is being viewed in Muzaffarnagar or you know uh, a textile is being made in Tirupur, they are undergoing social audits, and that is happening because of the the, the compulsions of the, the global supply chain. So the ideas of the world would say that you know I would want the social audit. I don't uh, you know I will work with the the, the, the regulation of the host country, but I want those uh, audits to be done. These improvements to be to be made, and that would drive you know some of these some of these. Uh, uh, and in terms of you know the uh, the the data data quality, you know I would uh, I would you know say that you know look at the. The last, you know, the the trends over the last uh, uh, six six uh, six years, and you would see that there is an increasing the you know, uh, 
increasingly you know high degree of uh, or high quality of data and information now we will will find in, in the in the city people because what is now happening is you know as there are as you know some of these issues the esg issues are, are becoming so you know earlier it, it used to be the health and safety department and you know they would add on this this duty to to that department now you see the the company secretary you see the board uh, the cost accountant is now uh, now they want to you know uh, understand this and then implement this so the, as the seriousness grows the 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 approval for you know, higher data quality will also increase. So, I have a interesting question to Manika Ji and Nandi Ji. How to create equal uh, importance of e related board agendas uh, in the mind of board? One factor of just to create awareness by knowing what has happened in the past. There have been cases where at one point of time, I mean we have come across cases where after 30 years of actually closing a mine, there has been a case filed, you know, against a, a company which was mining asbestos and that was, so there was no limitation as such. So I am saying that as and when awareness increases, that what has happened to other companies of course, and that to be more aware of what is the long term. For example, lithium being found. We don't know exactly that lithium mining, what all issues can it really do for the water. Or, so some studies, right from the beginning, there's always an environment impact assessment report which is being made. But maybe on a, maybe better it, like you said, that quality is going to get better. So similarly, the impact assessment reports the quality might get better. So, so once that awareness comes in that, uh, yes, in the long term, this could impact their profitability. And uh, like I said, uh, the boards should look at uh, improving the quality of their technology team also to ensure that uh, they have information before <coughs> and to take the right steps. My response is very simple. You should try to intake e-minded independent directors into the board so that all these things can be achieved. So you must identify e-minded independent directors. I have a question for next So everything can be achieved. Yeah, that's, that will be the last question. Sure. Uh, we talked about the level of disclosures and streamlining disclosures. Um, so should sustainability reporting uh, be voluntary and incentivizing or it should be compulsory and penalizing? Yeah. Until we reach that, because in law also we always were taught that, you know, after some time, once you make things mandatory, we have the classic example and jurisprudence about traffic lights. When it's made mandatory, then you automatically start imbibing it. So, till now, I mean, and we have had environmental laws, we don't be talking about me right now. So, so the 1980s, and it has been made mandatory. There were so many non compliances. For example, the famous case of common law, <coughs> that it was necessary to have environment clearance. People were not, and it was not exposed fact to nowhere was it written. The Supreme Court, after 30 years of it happening, had to lay down no, all your uh, mining was in violation of law, you have to pay the fine. So, till that time that it is imbibed, what Ranjit was saying, till the time it is imbibed, we need to have mandatory uh, regulations. Even though they might, and there, could, uh, there has to be always a fine tuning to those regulations to make it more meaningful, not just for a formality, you know, we are saying you comply. But that uh, exercise needs to be done, but it has to be moved. <laughs> The airline which I'll be traveling back today probably may not appreciate my e instinct, <laughs> but I'm very happy that I have received it. So, who can take it forward from me? Come forward and take this and plan this and regularly post it in the social website that the e factor is properly taken care of. <laughs> Any of you who can volunteer, you know, because as he said, everything is voluntary. 
but who can do that voluntary approach uh, very sincerely with lot of commitment he can and uh, you know and uh, with you also know the significance of this day at least you know for me so you know so this can be my e contribution to the terry institute today <laughs> with one condition you have to keep me posted yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right um, <laughs> i'd like to thank all this and in the campus only you cannot take it home <laughs> thank you for giving us this honor to rank their uh, albums based on their eco-friendliness and they're also using their massive global influence for a good cause that is by organizing a range of events such as concerts with K-pop stars to promote sustainability. Isn't that wonderful? All right. The topic for this panel discussion is evolving trends in business sustainability and environmental responsibility of corporates. Our speakers for today are Dr. Akhil Prasad, Director of Country Council India and Company Secretary at Boeing. Dr. Shikhar Ranjan, Secretary of the Indian Society of International Law. Dr. Ganesh Kaliya Parmal, Senior General Manager of Corporate Affairs, Communications and Sustainability at Bisleri International Private Limited. Ms. Jayati Talpatra, Founder of Dilli Meri Jan Vox and Professor Shalini Taneja, Associate Professor and Head of the Center for Sustainable Development at Four School of Management. Please uh, give them an round of applause. Uh, we extend a warm welcome to you all and thank you for taking out the time from your busy schedule to spend some time with us. The moderator for this session will be Dr. Shruti Sharma Rana, Assistant Professor at Teddy Sass. We also have Professor Ramakrishnan, Dean of Academics with us today. So uh, we request you to welcome our panelists and throw some light on the event, please. Thank you. And uh, my apologies for getting passion. But uh, I think uh, Dr. Vidhi made me do it. So, I am very happy to welcome all of you on behalf of the Terry School of Advanced Studies in my capacity as Dean Academic and in my individual capacity as a faculty member of 15 years standing. So most of my classes, in case you wanted to know, are scheduled after lunch. So if you go to sleep, don't worry, I will not feel bad. Okay. So uh, uh, I thank the National Foundation for Corporate Governance for supporting this workshop uh, and uh, this E in ESG is probably where everything started because in the 1960s uh, a lady named Rachel Carson wrote a book called The Silent Spring which talked about the disappearance of songbirds with the increasing use of DDT which was a wonder pesticide at the time and it really saved a lot of crops but it had all sorts of unintended effects. And at that time, the environmental movement uh, was somewhat adversarial towards industry. And you know, there were different shades of opinion within that environmental movement. But with uh, climate change and uh, extreme uh, weather events and other things, 
right at our doorstep that uh, confrontation has now changed into cooperation and dialogue, which is the heartening thing to see. So, uh, the national workshop title is E in ESG, Reflections for Corporate Governance and Sustainability. So, we have come a long way in that corporations are thinking about how to deal with this environment and sustainability and uh, society and governance. So we recognize that sustainability is a what is known as a wicked problem in that it will not admit of silver bullets. So you have to have multiple stakeholders and diverse ideas coming together to come up with something that either enables mitigation, adaptation or perhaps even prevents the ill effects of whatever activities we happen to do. Unfortunately, you know, ever since the industrial revolution we have been trying to prove uh, that we are the apex predator. So uh, now we have to deal with that consequences of that. So uh, this panel discussion is uh, should be extremely interesting. It is about business sustainability and the environmental responsibility of corporates and how the trends are evolving. And uh, I am also proud to note that many of our own students are presenting papers at this national workshop. So without further ado and uh, delaying the panelists. I would like to welcome all of them. I would like to welcome Dr. Akhil Prasad, Dr. Shikhar Ranjan, Dr. Ganesh Kaliyapirmar, Dr. Jayati Talpatra, Dr. Shami Taneja uh, and thank them for coming on a Saturday. Not just for spending time but coming on a Saturday to uh, you know, give us some snippets of their uh, ideas and wisdom. So uh, I also thank uh, again the National Foundation for Corporate Governance for sponsoring this event. And uh, I thank Dr. Vidhi, Dr. Shruti, all the other faculty members who put together this program. I thank the students for volunteering. I thank the students for participating so actively in this uh, workshop. And uh, have a nice day. And I won't keep you any further from issues of sustainability. Thank you. Since you are here, you will not have ever a film yeah, I mean, I'm always happy to do something useful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Manya, and uh, thank you so much all for patiently waiting uh, for uh, the panel two to start. I welcome you all for our panel discussion. Uh, uh, there is a very famous quote by Albert Einstein, and he says that uh, we cannot solve our problems by using same thinking which we created them, which we used when we created them. And the problems now of uh, you know businesses is there are two S which I say one is survivability, and second is business sustainability. And our panel discussion too is based on this agenda where we will talk about corporate environment responsibility and how does it lead to business sustainability. So uh, I would request my, I would welcome my esteemed panelists. We have quite diverse set of panelists here. So uh, looking for a very fruitful deliberations. Uh, I would, uh, the structure of the panel discussion would be, uh, there would be questions. First I will, uh, I will ask the panelists and then we will open to the audience in the later half. Uh, I would like to uh, ask my first question uh, to Dr. Akhil Prasad. 
and uh, it is how is corporate environment responsibility aligned to uh, business sustainability in Boeing? First of all, I must confess that coming to a, a conference which is which is filled with so many academicians and bright students, one has to come prepared. So you can go to other con other conference, but not but can go unprepared. But for here, you have to be well prepared. So thank you for the opportunity, um, and I must thank uh, Dr. Madan because. Uh, when we started a collaboration with Terry under the General Counsel Association, I think it was in our interest to come to an institution of excellence that industry and such institutions have to collaborate on issues like ESG, which is so very important. So the first thing which I would like to say on ESG is you, you may have heard from other panelists also that ESG will become the most important information center for all stakeholders in an organization whether it's the government whether it's the regulators whether it's the corporation financial statements perhaps may not provide that information which is needed by stakeholders which a esg report you know will entail and i think globally uh, all companies are putting a lot of a very very strong focus on esg reporting you know, in India, it is only for some of the top listed companies, but I'm sure that other than those listed companies, like companies which is like a Boeing India, and Boeing India is not a listed company. So effectively, what it means, we are not required to uh, comply with the ESG regulations as of now. But because of our global mandate, um, all subsidiaries, wherever they are, it is very, very important to embrace ESG. So first on sustainability, I think who would have thought three years ago when the when pandemic struck that uh, life will come to a standstill and the biggest impact was on interstate movement or within city movement and that was flying. The aviation industry was one of the hardest hit and the predictions were that till 2025, 2026, you know, nobody will be able to fly, there will be no vaccines. It started with a very negative and adult story. But today we are in 23 and we are almost pre-pandemic levels in terms of flying. So that's the power of sustainability. In Let me give you some numbers and I was reading our sustainability report. It says that by 2050, about 10, pe 10 billion people will be flying. So what does that mean? It means 10 billion people will fly, countries will need more aircrafts, countries will need more airports, Countries will need more aviation product and services manufacturers or producers. So for a company like Boeing, who is manufacturing a plane, they procure parts from almost about 180 countries. All those 180 countries have to be strong on ESG. Because when you are manufacturing an engine, whether you are manufacturing a body part, whether whatever you are doing, you have to ensure your commitment to environment protection. And for sustainability, I think the biggest challenge for us when we were sitting all in our homes doing COVID related work, the biggest uh, thing which we did with the government of India was to have the defense services excluded from all COVID restrictions. So even the first circular which came in March of 2020, it had an exception for our defense services. The defense services will be sustainable even during pandemic. And then it started to flow. We started to do our advocacy with the government of India that in order to ensure that the global production for aerospace and defense is sustainable, we have to ensure that all those companies who are helping in manufacturing of parts and components in India should also be exempted from the restrictions of the pandemic. So that is how we started to build our case on sustainability for aerospace and defense manufacturing in India. If you read our report, I think the first and foremost thing which is important for an aviation industry is safety. You would have read about two major crashes, you know, which happened on uh, related to the MAX, um, 77 MAX, unfortunately, um, which had a huge jolt for the company, not because it was simultaneous to the COVID impact, but because it had a huge question mark on the company about the safety of our products. 
and people used to question whether 737 max is a safe plane or not you know we have people from air india you know my my friend here and uh, you know the biggest one of the biggest customers for uh, boeing and airbus i think the biggest question in their mind also is when we are buying a 77 max whether it's a safe, safe product or not a safe product what happened was the moment two planes crashed there was a complete ban on 737 max for our global um, you know supplies what it meant it meant that the uh, revenue of Boeing company, which was then about $100 billion, it went down by $40 billion. 40% drop of revenue for a company which is which has about 140,000 employees. That was the impact. And that was a challenge, you know, we had to take up. That we have to ensure and convince the regulators that this is a safe product. And this is where, you know, we were, we went to the regulators, we started to demonstrate to the regulators, we were subjected to a lot of trials and testing. And then we were able to convince our regulators and we admitted, you know, it's in the public uh, knowledge that there were certain lapses which should not have, should not have been done at that point of time, but safety is paramount. And then, you know, the curbs were lifted and the company is now back on track. So what is important is, the most important thing in an ESG report is honesty. Whatever you disclose in your ESG report, it is not because you have to file it with SEBI. It is to, it is to be truthful and honest with all stakeholders. That is the purpose of the ESG report. And that is what is expected from every company. That when you are dealing with products and services, your ESG report should be your conscience and you cannot compromise on your conscience so sustainability and then let me talk about employees you know how will a company be sustainable a company will only be sustainable if you take care of its employees many companies during the pandemic also had to take very strong decisions about reducing its manpower we had to do the same we were about 180,000 people organization, we came down by 50,000 people. But the moment, you know, we were back, we started to get our business back, we rehired all those people. And we ensured that, you know, our policies, for example, we play a very strong role in terms of taking care of veterans. So in India, fortunately, our company does not have a retirement age. So we hire somebody who has finished uh, working with the defense services is at about 60, 60 years of age, we hire such people because we need experience. We have a very young population in Bangalore, in our engineering center, where the average age is about 30 years. But then in our defense sales, in our aerospace sales, we have a lot of experience, which is about 50 years and 50 years plus. So that is how the company is completely devoted about taking care of its employees. Another very important aspect is about your conscience, as I say. How do you ensure that your company has conscience? A company will only have conscience when your people are encouraged to speak up. And this institution will not be successful if students are not allowed to speak and voice their views. This institution will not develop if students provide back, uh, provide their inputs and the institution does not take care of those um, thoughts or suggestions. Likewise, our company has a very strong focus on talking to employees, taking care of their interests and if your workforce is happy, your sustainability is ensured. Your people will ensure, not technology, your people will ensure sustainability of an organization. And why Boeing is a 100 year old company, it still has a startup mindset. 100 year old organization continues to innovate. And that is why, because that innovation and spirit of doing bigger and better things is there. So we will continue to send rockets with NASA. We will continue to make better planes. We will continue to make better defense products. We will continue to ensure that the new plane that we launch is 25 or 30% more efficient 
than its previous version. We will continue to invest in better fuel, and that is how Boeing will or companies like Boeing think about the ESG. So my starting thoughts. Oh, very well said, uh, uh, Dr. Prasad. And I so agree with you, and I think all of you would agree with him that uh, trust is uh, one of the things where which is actually an outcome when you follow an ESG roadmap. So, and as uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Prasad said, that how trust helped Boeing to bridge the stakeholder deficit, trust deficit. So, uh, very rightly said. Uh, now, I will ask. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Shikhar Ranjan. Uh, how has uh, the international uh, environmental regulation evolved over the years? Uh, would you like to throw some light on that? Thank you very much, ma'am. After a very brilliant presentation by uh, Dr. Akhil, it's very difficult for me to uh, say something, but I will try my you know, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. We all are so, so Dr. Shikhar is, uh, has joined Air India, so that is why the context, yeah, that's the context. Uh, I have a very recent entrance into Air India, but here I have been, you all have as more of a researcher in international environmental law. That is my primary core area of work for several years. So, I would be largely speaking on my experience as a researcher in the international environmental law realm. And as also, uh, how uh, the international environmental law that has developed through the state centric process, because ultimately international multilateral environmental agreements or for that matter any international treaty that gets evolved, any bilateral treaty that, that gets evolved to the state which is the primary actor. But when the responsibilities are translated, when the responsibilities are translated and it has to be abided by at ground level, ground uh, level by the stakeholder, it is most of the time, it is the corporate or the business that has to take responsibility. And I will give you some illustrations that's why we we'll proceed further during uh, the talk. So let me first of all uh, uh, say that uh, the, the starting point in terms of development of international environmental law of the modern times is seen as the United Nations Conference on Human Environment of 19. 72 uh, all of you are aware with it uh, conference on human environment and this was the conference in only which two world leaders participated one the host country and the second the prime minister of india all of you are very familiar with her famous word poverty is the biggest polluter and still that remains a biggest challenge for us the first and foremost goal in sustainable development goals is poverty eradication that is the first and foremost goal. So what started in 72 remains relevant even now, 50 years uh, later. Second important point which comes in the journey of this environmental law is uh, the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So by a decade of two decades, we realize it is not only environment that will go. Uh, we require with environment development and so forth. So, and that is exactly what Mrs. Gandhi asked at Stockholm uh, that we need development to feed our teeming millions. We cannot go and it is you, the developed countries, who first of all by your colonization has taken away our resources. So we need to develop, we need to go, grow to feed our large population. So this is the debate which has started way back in 72, continues till now in every environmental, international environmental forum. So 1992 we have this, uh, uh, in, uh, this United Nations Conference on Environment and Development and as of now we all know that climate change has emerged as one of the most profound challenges that humanity is facing and the outcome or the most important outcome of this uh, Rio Conference on Environment and Development was that the adoption of the Framework Convention on Climate Change happened there. This Framework Convention on Climate Change happened there, but Climate Change Convention is not only about climate change. It is about energy, sustainable energy resources, how the energy which we are consuming remains sustainable and fossil fuel burning if it has to be stopped how economies can move ahead. So 
So ultimately, who will translate this? These are these has to be done by industries at all levels, whether it is the economy of the United States of America or the economy, the uh, our neighbor Pakistan, India, or any any such country. Certified emission reductions, that is what climate change convention talks about. Or clean development mechanism that has that climate change convention or the Kyoto Protocol brings about. So these are the things that have to be translated through concrete action by corporates only. Corporate social responsibility. The states assume the responsibility that, but the handling of those responsibility has to be by the economic sector, economic development activities. Uh, in between, I will just draw your attention to the fact that most of the development of international environmental law that has taken place has come through the realm of international economic law. Whichever branch of international environmental law you see, something like I will draw your attention, attention to a convention called Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. The title in the convention itself is International Trade. What they are trying to protect is uh, trade in endangered species. So economics always has been a has played a catalytic role in the development of international environmental law regime. Another important convention which affects our daily lifestyle uh, is something called 1989, 1989 Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste and their Disposal. This convention has uh, a unique history in the sense that uh, it evolved because there were increasing incidents of movement of hazardous waste from uh, the developed countries to developing countries. Uh, the statistics reveal that what the international trade that happens, illegal international trade that happens, first is arms and ammunition, second is uh, drugs and narcotics and in terms of the quantum of money involved, the third trade is the trade in hazardous waste. So you can imagine the amount of money that is happening and the entire trade happens in a clandestine manner. Countries in the developed world found it much easier not to invest hundreds of dollars in their own countries but to transfer it to Nigeria, transfer it to India, transfer it to Bangladesh, send it by way of shipping to these countries and dump it as many times these were dumped as uh, fertilizers, beneficial, beneficial for agriculture but later a uh, large amount of uh, toxic effects were found affecting the population at large and all these things happened. So in the backdrop of this convention, uh, in the backdrop of this, this 1989 convention award, and one of the key things that the uh, 1989 convention talks about is environmentally sound management of hazardous waste. Who will do this environmentally sound management of hazardous waste? The, it is defined as uh, uh, environmentally sound management of hazardous waste means waste uh, management of waste in such a manner that the adverse effects on environment and human health is minimal. Ultimately, it is the industry which is the waste producer that will have to take uh, this challenge heads on. And in compliance with that convention, government of India initially in 1989 drafted a set of regulations. This set of regulations when it was drafted in 1989 had just 18 categories of waste. Taking you in a bit detail, just 18 categories of waste. And from 1989 to 2016, this law got repealed three times. And ultimately the new law which is in existence is of 2016. It runs into more than 100 pages with three different schedules. Uh, with three different schedules in which more than 44 industrial production processes are listed uh, so which to an extent signifies that large amount of industry although the, uh, primarily the target of this convention is chemical industry but most of the industries including the place where you get your car vehicle service is regulated by this particular convention because one of the very dangerous products that comes out from there is waste oil. So even that or uh, the paint that comes out of it. So this, this is the way the industries are getting regulated through uh, international convention. My esteemed panelist mentioned about the tragedy in aircraft industry. Similar tragedy happened in shipping industry. 
shipping industry what had happened that if the all oil containers were on the basis of single hull structure uh, these were moving on the basis of single hull structure uh, there was a tra shipping uh, tragedy happened and uh, container uh, got damaged there was oil spillage in the high seas uh, aquatic marine flora and fauna got disturbed oil spill uh, this led to a very big international uproar leading to change in shipping regulation governed by international maritime organization all the ships from there on on uh, were required to be compulsorily if you are sending a ship for a uh, international trade it has to be a double hull structure ship and uh, suffice it to mention it to you that 90% of the international trade takes place is through shipping so which means this is one business opportunity that you have now a new double hull ship structures to be created but another business opportunity where we come into picture in third world countries is that the ships which were discarded they started moving to countries like ours and we became one of the biggest ship recycling industry in the world india bangladesh uh, china these are the countries which are as of now getting 90% of the shipping but again uh, ships were recycling ships for dismantling ships were dismantling not, not for recycling but ships were dismantling is coming to our part of the world uh, in india most of the ships which come are at a place called alang in gujarat most of the ships come uh, to a place called uh, Alang in Gujarat and uh, it is probably a 14,000 crore uh, industry but most of the work that takes place uh, is uh, unregulated, highly unregulated structure but uh, over the years uh, to ensure that the shipping happens, the ship recycling happens in an uh, uh, environmentally sound manner Again, an international convention under the auspices of Basel Convention and uh, International Maritime Organization and UNEP has been adopted for something Hong Kong Convention on Safe Ship uh, Dismantling and Recycling. A side effect of that, because all these international legislations have to be translated into your domestic. So we are one of the first countries which has enacted the Recycling of Ship uh, Act in 1900 and uh, sorry 2000. 16. So, in, uh, and the demand for having the framework for having a safe and sound recycling came from the uh, recycling in ship recycling or ship dismantling industry itself. Uh, uh, the additional factor was that in India it could happen quickly because the Prime Minister happened to be that from that state itself he was very well aware of the needs of the industry. And why the ship recycling happens is ship dismantling happens. Is, 90% of the material that you get from ship is high quality steel. So for steel, if you go for industrial mining, if you go from uh, doing from uh, making steel from raw material, and if you are getting recycled, uh, recycled steel, high quality recycled uh, steel, the economics work out to be much better. And even otherwise, mining is a uh, supposedly a very dirty industry. So this aspect uh, which we see happening uh, in ship recycling industry or climate, uh, 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 climate related negotiations uh, play a crucial role. Third fact which I will now take to you away from here is uh, we talked about the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development. So it recognizes that environment and development has to go hand in hand. And in 1987, you all are aware, very well aware that World Commission on Environment and Development had come up with its report called Our Common Future. Our Common Future came and the mantra of sustainable development came with that. Development that meets the needs of present generation without compromising on the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. This intergenerational equity concept of sustainable development that came through the 1992 convention we see it getting translated in World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002 and this summit takes place in Johannesburg. Nearly every world leader participates in it. Nearly all the 183 members of the United Nations are represented either at head of government or head of uh, state level. 
which means that 1972 when the environmental movement started when only two leaders were sensitized about it two world leaders were sensitized about the need for environmental protection in 2002 we see that nearly all the planet is participating in the race to protect the planet for our own survival for our own sustenance that is how the movement of uh, international environmental law has been uh, another aspect is that in 2002 we very clearly recognized uh, there are numerous bulky documents adopted by these summit diplomacy or international environment summit adopts a large number of documents uh, 1990 we adopted something called agenda 21 it runs into 450 pages or odd pages but if you look at that document from managing fisheries to managing uh, toxic chemicals uh, uh, environment impact assessment that is now part and parcel of our environmental law regime all these concepts are very well illustrated in that document and most of the countries in the world have adopted environmental legislations in their domestic levels to give effect to it. To give effect to it. 1992 journey that uh, moved on to 2002, we adopted something called Johannesburg Declaration and Plan of Implementation, Plan of Action to Implement Johannesburg Declaration. Uh, these documents uh, tell you how international leaders have been, uh, uh, the leaders have been perceiving the problem of environment and development and they very clearly recognized in 2002 summit that economic development, social development and environment, uh, environment protection, these are the three pillars in a uh, triangle, they have to go hand in hand. Environment protection cannot be done in isolation. Uh, to conclude, I would just uh, 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 conclude what I have to uh, talk to you about. I would say that as of date, we have more than 3,500 uh, multilateral or bilateral environmental agreements. And these agreements nearly cover each and every aspect of our life from the rockets uh, uh, or the satellites that go into space to uh, the ground beneath when satellites go into space after a point of time they convert into space debris because when they become out of use they become waste similarly uh, many things uh, below the, the food chain the webs water cycle all of things all of these things are supposed to be regulated by the international environmental law regime and it is one of the fastest and most dynamic branch of international law that is here on day and it regulates everything including uh, aviation industry because the aviation that comes out from aviation industry is also required to be uh, controlled. We all need to fly but in a way that the impact on our planet is minimal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shikhar Ranjan. Actually, uh, that was quite insightful. And thank you for taking us through the journey of environmental law. How has it evolved over the years? And uh, as you mentioned uh, during your talk, that uh, uh, the environment regulations are going stricter by every passing day. You know, and businesses are the one I think which are wearing the brand. So this brings me to our next speaker, uh, Mr. K. Ganesh uh, from Missionary International. And I would like to ask you that uh, how has Bislary, uh, you know, tackled this problem and uh, uh, created, in fact, uh, has aligned itself towards business sustainability? So how has corporate environment responsibility led towards the business sustainability of Bislary India? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shruti. Uh, thank you, Terry, for giving me an opportunity to be here as part of the panelists. And uh, it was really interesting that I heard from Mr. Akhil and Mr. Shikhar so about the aviation and uh, the, even the shipping. So let me move towards the uh, industrial things like, because I am from an industry background. So I work for a company where we manufacture packet drinking water. Okay, that's a essential water is required for us all. Okay, so sustainability is a very important thing. Uh, as we all know that the ESG started way back in 2009, slowly it got transformed, 2009 it was a 
voluntary guidelines. And later on, the SAP has given a uh, mandate for 100 top listed companies to submit their reports on the industry part. Then later on, it become a 500, com uh, 500 companies. Now it's 1,000 companies. And also in between, now BRSR is also there. So it is a transformation or evolution of ESG, which is slowly coming into, and that's why we all are here. Because if this subject is not there, there is no nothing to discuss on the environment front. Okay. And also about the guidelines and regulations. This started way back in 1972 onwards. India started regulating this in 1972 and 1985. The Ministry of Environment started. Okay. Then they started working on the environment protection with respect to air, water, noise, then soil and thermal. So this was the main category like. Then they diverted from the central to the state. So now in MOEFCC, it has become MOEFCC, climate change also they have included in that. We are slowly, slowly they got transformed. They have a central pollution control below them, which is controlling from the central. Then after the state pollution control board and pollution control committees. So these are the various committees or boards which is controlling all the activities. Maybe it may be air pollution, maybe it may be a water pollution or it may be other pollution, hazardous pollutions. So all these departments are having various people who are working on that. And also recently they had emerged into a, a solid waste management also. Because not only air, water and other thing, now we started dumping all our waste to the land. So that is going to create a big problem. That's why even nationally and internationally also people are discussing about the solid waste management and they come down, drill down to plastic waste management. Then they are coming to e-waste management, then construction waste management. There are lots of opportunities. You guys are having a very good uh, thing future. So this is going to be a very big, big uh, thing like uh, uh, not going to boom up like anything because the industry, any company wanted to sustainably run their business, they need to follow all the steps. Without that bypassing, they cannot run their business. And second is pandemic had helped us a lot to learn lots of things in the life. So being a packet drinking water company, so as an essential commodities, we also shut our plant during the COVID time. But there was huge pressure from the government. They had asked us, you being a packet drinking water company, you should supply water to all the people, the COVID warriors and other people. We consulted our employees, but the employees resisted initially because we were not knowing what will happen. Yeah, no one was allowed to go to the road and uh, they were just watching TV and then they were panicked to see and uh, didn't they go out to the outside their house to purchase any uh, daily items like even uh, the milk and other items. So they were very much worried. So they didn't even go out or travel to see their parents also who stayed little far away. So with that, we tried to convince our employees. We took them and then boarded them near to our factory itself. We provided them the entire accommodation, food, everything to them and conveyance also. And we taken only selected set of people. They will come to the company. They will go back to the room and their sanitation was taken care. So by this process, within a couple of days, we started activating our all the water business and then we started supplying. And we didn't supply to the markets and other places. We majorly focused immediately on the hospitals and the police who were there in the room. So we taken as a drive that during the period, whatever water supplies needs to go to the hospitals and police stations or whoever the COVID warriors, it was sent as a complimentary to them. We didn't charge anything to them. And also luckily our employee was supporting and slowly we got employees slowly one by one coming into the offices. And we didn't stop any employees or we didn't, uh, we had all our 100% strength of our employees. They were working some from house, some from uh, office. So we had online and offline processes also to monitor, but the operation team was fully entirely dedicated working in the plants. We didn't even stop or we didn't uh, remove any of our employees from our systems because it because they are not a pandemic situation and they are very much disturbed. So it's not a good ethic things. So as a management, we are taken a decision that employees should be paid in time and then they should they should not be worried about their uh, thing, professionals. So also we also covered all our employees under the COVID insurance policies also. 
So we have taken even the direct and indirect employees also in the policies. So this has helped us a lot and that's why we as a bisleri company, it's been 52 years old and we have still the name trust and then the confidence on the thing. And also we are happy that as we are supplying a safe and healthy hygienic water, lots of waterborne diseases which used to happen earlier, it has also reduced. So as a business governance, so our aim is to ensure that the negative impact due to the environment is being minimized, reduced. So we have taken lots of steps and also we have gone in for some green uh, energy systems like solar plants in our offices and uh, or, uh, water treatment plants, we use RO waters. You know, regularly we use our RO waters in our house. The RO water, the permit versus rejection, if you say, the, the accepted water and the rejected water, it is 60-40 ratio or 70-30 ratio. So 40% of the water we were draining it out. Then we went for an innovation and then we discussed with our water treatment plant vendors. And finally now we have come out in a state that 95% of the water is being accepted and only 5% rejected. And even that 5% is taken for gardening purposes and for the housekeeping purposes. So even some of our plants are also zero liquid discharge plants. Similarly on the plastic front also we had been working on the plastic and we ensure that whatever plastic is being used is being collected back. Again there is an obligation from the government, there is a policy called extended producer responsibility. That means whatever plastic we are putting in the market we need to ensure that. That also we started and we are proud that last year 21-22 we were a plastic neutral company. And the water also we had been taking water from the mother earth and then filling water and then giving to the consumers. Again we have started an initiative for water also we started construction check dams. We started having rainwater harvesting system in our plants and we adopted ponds in the villages. By this process we are able to give 8 times more water what we take from the mother earth. So we are also a water positive company. So these are some of the initiatives actions which Bisleri has taken and uh, we also wish that all the other companies also to follow the same suit so that we ensure that the environment is protected and each and every one individual is enjoying the greenness and the environment. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Ganesh. Uh, they say doing well by doing good is the philosophy uh, where, where the businesses can survive. So uh, it's, it seems Bisleri fulfills that and uh, going now to another speaker, uh, Ms. Jayati Talpatra. Uh, I would li like to ask Jayati, uh, when we talk about uh, corporate environmental regulations, uh, I would I want to hear your point of view about biodiversity and uh, how are corporates uh, taking uh, biodiversity and aligning them with business sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just to wake all those people in the back row who are sleeping, a question to everybody. So uh, what was the last convention on climate change? Where was it? What was it called? Right? What was the last convention on biodiversity and where was it? Very nice, very happy. So uh, yes, but just very, you, you can see the difference in just understanding biodiversity versus climate change. So uh, I'm going to uh, bring the focus on us, which is people sitting in the room, which is students, because I work with all of you. I also teach in other B schools and my own uh, alma mater, which is XLR, right? So I'm going to use that as a sample set just to liven things up. Uh, when I go to them, right, and them, and most of my batchmates are now CXOs in different organizations, and I go to them with, okay, so here we are, and uh, uh, as our uh, United Nations Secretary General says, a delay means death, let's do something. They're all very excited, and it's changed. Uh, six years back, they were not excited. Now they are. They're very excited. So they come all ready to listen to my session on climate change. The moment I start broaching the topic of biodiversity, there is complete silence. Right? So, um, thank you for the person who knew it was COP15, uh, which was uh, uh, again held in Egypt. COP, the, the one in Glasgow, the climate change one, COP, uh, COP28, the whole world was there in their private jets, but they were there, right? The heads of uh, countries were there. COP15, even the host nations' head was not there. 
right? The, in, in, in Montreal, just 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 goes in there. So it's that's how little the importance of biodiversity is, which is uh, which is interesting because if you look at the three problems which the humanity faces today, one third is climate change, one third is biodiversity, one third is pollution, right? And biodiversity is an important part of climate change. So to segregate that and to be completely unaware of it is is a little crazy. So uh, if the, the question which uh, Dr. Uh, Rana is asking is how are corporates looking at it? If it is a manufacturing concern, they are aware. So I'll give you an example. If it's a I won't name the uh, organization, but a steel steel manufacturing organization, really large, they are aware that they are going into very very rich biodiverse areas to do their exploration to do their mining so they are aware of it so therefore they try to there are certain kind of can mention this forest uh, you know rights act and there is a, you know indigenous people act and now there's a lot of focus on indigenous people and you know so there's a lot of activism so therefore some element of thought on biodiversity is given by organizations in exploration and mining and exploration if i go to any other organization whether it's fmcg or, or services it's not understood which is interesting because um, so what's the what's the target that we have for climate change what, what are we aiming for well, how much biodiversity have we lost over the last 50 years you are not allowed to answer you're from my class so uh, so yes so 60, close to 70 percent 70 percent of biodiversity has been wiped out in the last 50 years right and where does most of this biodiversity lie what is the typical thing that you hear of when you hear of organizations talking about we do our stuff for biodiversity and we do what do you normally hear huh? yeah let's make tree let's plant trees right that's it. where does most of the biodiversity lie in marine life and where else so therefore we should be looking at wetlands not just trees where else soil right it's your soil so it is just below the soil and above the soil those who come from a box i do this demonstration so uh, it's there so it's the soil that we need to take care of and it's the soil that we tend to take for granted so most, so a handful of soil, just a handful of soil, if it's a good, healthy soil, has more organisms than all the people on this planet. A handful of soil. If it's not degraded, most of our soil is degraded. One third of the planet's soil is degraded. So we've lost a lot of biodiversity there. We've lost a lot of it through wetlands. So uh, through um, our mangroves. So there are a lot of these spots that we've lost biodiversity for. So again, what do corporates tend to attribute a lot of importance to tree plantation which is great uh, because it also acts as a carbon offset that's the language they understand right so uh, because uh, carbon offset is also happening here so biodiversity also sort of happens it's, it's okay it looks good on the sustainability report so there is that's where we are in terms of biodiversity when it comes to organizations that it's, 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 it's very, very low. Uh, when uh, I started teaching economics of biodiversity, life was very difficult till Professor Das Gupta, uh, please read up, uh, professor of uh, Cambridge, who came out with this seminal work on economics of biodiversity. So till then, my students and I used to, used to, used to struggle with, you know, how do we evaluate the value of, you know, biodiversity? How do we evaluate? Because unless I evaluate a value, I'm not going to take find it important, right? Why is uh, why are we so concerned about climate science? Because fossil fuel is valued, right? There's a value attached. There's no value attached to most of the biodiversity elements, right? So to derive today, there are lots of lots of research where we talk about this is the uh, value of one tree per year, this much uh, oxygen. So there's a lot of research on that happening now. So, but Professor Dasgupta made it much easy. Uh, do read up his uh, paper, Economics of Biodiversity, easily available, uh, where he talks about uh, the various economic values of biodiversity. But at the end of it all, when I go back to organizations, after having shown all those graphs and charts on economic value, I come back to what uh, Mr. Akhil Prasad actually said, that just be 
Con just just look at your conscience and just at the end of it be honest and do the right thing. But they can only do that when they understand bad honesty. That's not something which is very intuitively understood, right? So that is one thing. The oh, the recent most or just the last point. The recent most uh, uh, let's say regulation or guideline for bad honesty. Are you all aware of that? The the COP fifteen person. Do you know what came out? Thirty by thirty. Yes, thank you so much. He's he's not in my class, but he knows everything. So, uh, do you want to explain it? Okay. So, uh, the thing which came out was that thirty percent of the world, the Earth's ecosystem, will be protected by twenty thirty. Right. So, if we need to protect, so we put them into zones of no development or whatever, whatever, and we kind of take care of that. So, that's the latest, most as early as just a month back. That's the mandate which has come, which has many repercussions. We can discuss it at length post the session, but that's where we are on biodiversity. Thank you, Jayanti, actually uh, for raising this concern also, as far as corporates are concerned, as far as businesses are concerned, and uh, I agree that uh, what can be uh, measured can be managed, and I think this is uh, one aspect where we lack in biodiversity. Uh, we need to have more clear, uh, uh, distinct uh, uh, biodiversity valuation. Uh, we need to make people aware, and as it is, uh, you know, um, as it is one of the most important aspect, even for the business sustainability. It's not the concern only for the planets, but for the business as well. Uh, so, from this thought, I would uh, again, uh, move, I would move to our uh, final uh, uh, panelist, uh, Professor Shalini Taneja. Uh, we welcome you, ma'am. And uh, yeah, ma'am is from a, an academic background. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Shalini that, uh, according to you, what are the factors driving the change towards corporate environment responsibility? Thank you. And when you are the last one to speak, and then you think they have all covered the points. The bolu kya mein? Thank you. So my co-panelists have actually talked about the various case studies. I would say what their companies are doing and how they are actually trying to touch the life of various set of stakeholders. And I'm very happy they have talked about a very important stakeholder for any company that's employee. Employee perspective, and uh, they have given very beautiful example. I was just noting now. I am uh, a professor who teaches corporate social responsibility, so I will give you a little background because CSR is a part of sustainability. And when we talk about community development activities, it's very very important. And we have a law now, and it was all a paradigm shift to what my co-panelist Mr. Ganesh was talking about. About BRR earlier it was BRR now we have BRSR so business uh, responsibility sustainability reporting it's my dear students and all the all the um, uh, guests who are here it was a paradigm shift if you see it did not happen suddenly we had earlier two thousand seven guidelines two thousand eleven were entry guidelines for Ministry of Corporate Affairs when we talk about CSR. Then in 2013, the law came into effect. So it was 1st April 2014 when we talk about the Section 135 of the Companies Act 2013 on CSR. And I remember I was attending a conference in SCO with one of very renowned professor from MDI, he was my one of my guide. And you know, the house was full of the CEOs, the managing director, the NGO people. And all were saying, why we are going to have a law? Why this 2%? A lot of you went cry, right? But the public policy representatives are very clear. Please understand the intent. The intent was not to disturb. Intent was not wanted to take the money from the corporate. It was their money. It was the shareholders' money. Intent was partnerships. Intent was their support. Intent want to make, make an impact in the society, what we do, inter, say intervention projects, the CSR projects, the community development projects, even the environmental projects for the community around us. Because you are prayed in that community, you take the land, you have responsibility when we talk about responsibility towards your society. We say now we have to give something back to the society. What back to the society? Is there any theory? Yes, there is a theory behind it. So we must understand the the background before before we talk about why we are talking about why we're talking about impact why we're talking about measurement and why we're talking about from where the impact or measurement will come until and unless 
So first of all, you have to do, you have to undertake various CSR initiatives for your community who get impacted because of our business. We have a law, many companies go beyond 2% also. Even when there was no law, many companies, many Indian companies, they were doing and we have very classic example, right? Even uh, Tata Sustainability Index is one of the very classic example we have. So it's not new for us, for the Indian context if you see, but there is a paradigm shift which came. So we must understand. And when there is a shift, so because I train a lot of uh, future managers because we uh, are having MBA programs, PhD programs. So when I talk to my students, I said, you are going to be a future manager. What value you are going to taking, I mean, uh, uh, carry for, for, for your company in which you are going to join. So we sensitize them. That's our responsibility as a professor. We train them. What is CSR? What is the law? right what are the implications of the law and when the company is going to do how you are going to help the company because you are outsourcing the csr activities to an ngo because that's an implementing partner so driver ki seat pe aapko hi baithna because it's your csr but there has to framework which needs to be created so as a student as a researcher as a consultant we must know how this partnership framework comes into existence how you are going to make it effective that's more important Right, and how you are going to make and trying to capture the impact, what we talked about, uh, your social return on investment, that's very important. My corporate friends are sitting here, I hope they will be uh, more learned than me to explain how to calculate the social return on investment. So when you are talking about social because they have invested, whether it's 10 crore, 50 crore, 100 crore, 2000 crore in the society. So what impact they are getting? Then they have tried. So I think um, as, a, as a researcher, as a student, we must learn, we must appraise others that how these type of reports are being made. Whether we talk about CSR reporting, whether we talk about business responsibility, sustainability reporting, whether we talk about ESG, because ESG one is social. Social is we are also talking about stakeholders. What type of stakeholder framework a company is having? So what are their internal, external, or the market, not market stakeholders? So I think from academic perspective, a researcher's perspective, and I do a lot of consultancy with companies also when we interact with them, the very important point I think we all must take into account is what are their expectations? We must understand. So we must create an index, we must create some, uh, what we say, parameters because she talked about drivers. One of the most important drivers for any company to do CSR is brand building. I hope they will agree with me. Right? How much value you are going to create for my company? Why should I hire you? What type of value you are going to bring? So I must say, a trade-off. 17,000 ka package, 25,000 ka package, or 25,000 ka package, or 15. So it's a trade-off. So as an academician, as a researcher, we also try to actually inculcate those type of, uh, you can say that the brainstorming session of value or those type of literature, the, the student must understand. So I think uh, apart from the brand building, it is very important to make a connect with the community, to make a connect with the vendors, your employees, your uh, shareholders, because now the shareholders have become very, very aware, right? They, before they invest into company, they wanted to see ethical policy, hai, CSR, kya karne hai, sustainability, mein kya, how much awards and accolades they have, adding their long list of drivers. We can explore. You can go to the Google Scholar, type these keywords, you will have lack and lack of articles which are being written. Do a literature review. Talk to the corporates, they are here. Understand. Interviews low inka jake pucho, they will give you what is currently going into the reality. That is industry. Because ultimately, your aim is to join the industry or the public policy think tank or maybe some consultancy. So, gap has to be bridged. That is why I always tell my uh, peers who are working in the industry, please give them live projects. Involve the students in the live project. Give them the opportunity. Right? So please help them. I think that is a gap we need to bridge. And I request here also the uh, corporate panelist here, wherever go, I request. Try to, uh, I mean, give something to the community which are here and we are here to listen to us so that they should be able to gain some knowledge from your experience and the best practice which your company is doing so that they can write down as a form of case study. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Professor Shalini. Thank you for bringing in the correlation between ESG and the equity, brand equity. Uh, now, uh, I would like to open uh, uh, the panel to questions from audience. Yes, please, if anyone would have questions to the panelist. raised a very important question yes. and in fact uh, a minute or two would not suffice to answer that question it requires because international nuclear law in itself is a very big subject uh, the whole corpus of international atomic energy agency is uh, devoted to you but uh, uh, one way in which uh, nuclear energy becomes important is uh, that it is one of the most uh, sustainable sources of production of energy. But the danger with it is well known. Chernobyl happened during our lifetime, like many of our lifetimes, not yours. That happened in our lifetime. So nuclear uh, reactors are dangerous proposition. So that is why there is a rigid control on uh, moving towards uh, nuclear energy. We had signed an agreement with United States of America and the US nuclear deal, uh, but till date, nothing has happened on that front. So, uh, and the group that controls nuclear energy is not willing to uh, share the technology with other parts of it, other uh, players. And countries are like ours or even Iran, you see every day in the debate, uh, these countries are not able to develop themselves to the extent that. 70% uh, of their uh, electricity supply can be through nuclear energy. Probably France has the highest. France has the highest supply of nuclear energy. But it's a very complicated area. But it is one of those areas in which a lot of scientific efforts are required to be done. Uh, from a lawyer's perspective, uh, uh, we are more concerned with the liability aspect of it. Liability and compensation of, of that regime uh, is the key role for us. So maybe we can have some other time, some other day, a full session on nuclear energy. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Charvian. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ranjan. Any other question from the audience? Hello, ma'am. I have got the mic. I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you, panel panelists. It was really lively and very insightful session. I mean, I got to learn a lot from the corporate point of view, how, uh, especially uh, what efforts Bisleri is taking and it is really good to know that they trust their employees and are trying to do the best for them as well. I've got a question for Dr. Prasad especially. Uh, the, uh, the, the technology which, la which lapsed, uh, I guess twice or something like that. How did the company manage to be transparent and open about it? With, while keeping in mind the negative aspects of being open about the uh, damages that might have been there and how did it manage to make sure the company stays sustainable for the long term even when they are going to they, are, they may be able to they may have to face a lot of negatives from the people or the public I think it's about uh, you know uh, once you are honest and honesty is inside you and you are talking to uh, various people, they are able to relate to you. Uh, for example, these two things happen because of an MCAS issue. An MCAS issue perhaps was something which uh, uh, we had to be more transparent about. It, it perhaps had to be in our manuals and training uh, manuals, but perhaps it was not there. So I think the first and foremost thing is when you are faced with a problem, you face the problem. 
head on and then in our case it was very important to first analyze whether we should hide it or we should disclose it and i think there was unanimous decision that it has to be disclosed that whatever wrong doing or something which was a shortcoming we have to own it and if when you own it and the world will then see that you know something was wrong but the company is not shying away from making improvements and then you know the technology was explained to the customers and to the regulators um, uh, you know if you uh, you know if you were to follow the aviation industry whether it's a airbus whether it's a boeing the sustainability of a aviation manufacturer which is a boeing or a airbus is linked to the backlog of planes so for example boeing currently has a backlog of about 6500 planes airbus has a backlog of about 7000 planes which means that if we do nothing for next 10 years the factories will run because of the backlog or the orders that we have the order book and you are absolutely right for us it was a huge task because out of those 6500 planes which are in the backlog uh, about 60 percent were 77 maxes so for us it was very important and essential to first own up the truth so that is what happened when the company was taken to the department of justice and when you know a fine of 2.5 billion was imposed on the company the company agreed to pay the company did not go in for appeal although they may, may have some legal rights to do so but sometimes you have to keep a balance of what is legally right what is versus what is morally right and i think esg is about morally being morally being correct not legally being correct and that is what uh, you know we always advise our board that when we are talking about an ESG issue, it has to be morally correct. And that is where everybody sees it. Because you are the opinion maker. You know, the moment you see to crash, you see something about, think about going, that something is wrong. And then when we try to satisfy you by countering your argument, you know, it goes nowhere. So I think the perception setting has to be clear. And that is what we do. That is why he has mentioned the word honesty. That's very important. ESG is honesty, conscience, conscience of the company. It's a report about your consciousness. Yeah, okay, so one last question from the audience. Uh, so we have been talking and listening to a lot about sustainability, ownership, shareholders, stakeholders. So my question is when we are talking about CSR, uh, we know that the community development project and the corporates are doing there are multiple reasons. So from the corporates perspective, I want to know that when you identify a project, is it the company wants to do this project or is it a need-based project i mean the other way around that this community this is the need of this community so we know a lot of baseline survey and need assessment study a lot of things happen but i want to know from your uh, own experience that what are your thoughts that what is the practice at your organization and how it add more, adds more value to the end where it, we talk about sustainability, which is community ownership. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? I can start and perhaps you can add from the corporate. So I think under section 135 of the companies that you see some focus areas, government and prescribe certain areas where you can do your CSR. But to answer your question, last three years change everything. In last three years, whatever, what was the most important thing was healthcare. Because in the Delta II wave, what we saw, there was a complete uh, anarchy. You know, anarchy in terms of hospitals not there, oxygen cylinders not there. Uh, you know, and it was not because of the government. It, it was because it was so sudden that no country was prepared for it. And because of our large population that we have, I think it was felt, it was the impact was felt more in India. So I think on the necessity, COVID, I think everything moved from, say for example, setting up an education center or setting up of a toilet to everything focused around COVID. And then people wanted to invest. Uh, so for our company, for example, we set up a few hospitals, one in Bangalore, one in Assam, and then we started to donate ventilators. 
so it depends you know when you are fa- when your country is facing a situation like this that is exactly what the csr committee should be focusing that rather than following a 135 schedule uh, it should be aimed at what is more needed in the country and especially if you see 135 it is about where the company is located and the area around that uh, uh, office where you have to do the csr activity so that is exactly the role of a csr committee that they should be looking at what is the most desirable thing which a csr should you know face that's what i think you may want to add true even uh, if you see it's a problem of demand and supply supply from the company side demand from the community side so there has to be balance he is rightly said because that was the need of the hour to invest in the health health sanitation protection otherwise the companies the companies which i have in track during my career they do for impact as a, this uh, based science study need assessment study they call it the need of that's very important. i told about expectations what your community expect is equally important because they wanted to do they have their own agenda they have their uh, what with budgets with them but they also take care what is the need of their community around within the vicinity whether it's 10 kilometers 20 kilometers where their plants are located right and then you have some budget across your uh, geographical location also depending upon company to company so it it is a their uh, csr committee along with the csr department Uh, if i'm not wrong they take care of and the what is the need of that area around which they whether they have a plant in jharkhand they have a plant in punjab they have some uh, i mean they plant somewhere in kolkata near kolkata so they see what are the issues which their communities are facing do we have an ex- expert yeah even though not within your registered office yes section 6 is how people have lost their life true true so companies focus the the what we say the vicinity is only for the manufacturing the companies in the secondary sector what about the companies who are in the tertiary sector they don't have a plants they have their offices that to in the post location so what is the definition of your community so if you see their csr report on the website or their annual record they have defined their community the definition of the community for whom they are doing csr has been defined very well so it is not about only within the vicinity i agree you have to go beyond that depending on you must have the justification you must have why you are going there that's very important and as as a community we must understand we must understand the move of that corporate i think the balance has to be there so i think they also need your contribution they also need your acceptance so thank you yeah thank you so much professor shalini and thank you so much all uh, for patiently listening uh, to the panel discussion i would uh, sum up the panel discussion by saying uh, by, by taking uh, the insights from all the panel uh, panelists here that uh, environment and society is where we live in and development is what we do in order to survive so unless and until the businesses are aligned to the environment and society its sustainability is impossible for them so thank you all uh, thank you all thank you to all my panelists for being here have a good day thank you thank you so much Thank you, panelists. We are all very appreciative of the knowledge you have shared with us today. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, I would like to request Dr. Vidhi. Yes. We will now have the technical sessions and people presentations. Our uh, session one will be conducted in the conference hall on the second floor of the administrative block. Uh, session two will be conducted in the seminar hall on the ground floor. Greenwashing is basically an entity that is falsely claiming to be working in the sustainable de- sustainable sector or following green practices, but in actuality it isn't. It's just misleading the the people and the public.
and also like we have the banks they have a threat of uh, you know, these risks so these need to be worked upon and these need to be tackled so that these are not roadblocks in the in india's journey for a uh, prosperous green finance now we we'll wrap it up and we so this is a conclusion from the swot analysis and all the study that we undertook Uh, we can always work on our strengths and opportunities. We talked very, uh, we uh, elaborated on the SWOT, SWOTs, and they there are always major um, weaknesses and threats. So we need to work, learn from the experiences of other countries, and work on them to make sure that these are not roadblocks. And we can always. <laughs> So, from the flood management domain, what kind of business opportunities are coming from? Okay. If you will not map that, then there is no point. The the study is not complete. Okay. okay. And second thing is that these flood sectors are denser, very uncertain. So their rate of interest is always very high by the banks. So if the green bond will come, then how the rate of interest would change from these uncertain <coughs> projects? Then you have to talk about it. Mom, back. Uh, there is about one word known as premium. Basically, these bonds have less yield as compared to the other bonds in the market. So basically, that premium is the risk that the Indian investors are bearing. They consider it as their obligation towards the environment. So obviously, that uh, the yield is bit less, but surely there is a scope for the no, no problem. Is it starts <coughs> small, but then someday some problem comes. Then they make it a marketable security, and then they put another bonds attached with mm -hmm. it, and then they sell it like another marketable security, and that's where the problem lies. We have seen it previously also how America had these huge problems. Yes, so so that's, that's how. That's the green washing actually. So uh, there is, should be a proper integrated methodology that should be designed. <coughs> yeah. So apparently, which is my observation that the. अभी लॉन्ग टाइम तक कोई भी ग्रीन बॉन्ड्स को यूज नहीं करना ओके इट विल बी डिफिकल्ट फॉर देम टू यूज सो इसका इंपेडिमेंट रहेगा बिकॉज़ पीपल आर नॉट अवेयर वंस एंड सेकंड थिंग इज दैट दे दे डोंट वांट टू वेंचर इनटू अंटिल दे आर श्योर ओके थैंक यू फॉर योर क्वेश्चन थैंक यू थैंक Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My topic is ESG enabling value creation in Indian e-commerce, <clears throat> and thank you all for uh, for this opportunity. I'd like to thank Dr. Shruti, my guide, who's also here in this room. So I'll take this forward. So, just to give you a background, the industrialization since the late 18th century, uh, there was a little concern for how we do production and what's the impact on the environment. So, they don't go hand in hand. It's only now that we realize <clears throat> and we try to put those business processes that were in play and set things in order. So, I'm just giving this context because I'm going to talk about the e-commerce industry, which is a growing industry, and hence the relevance of this, uh, this research. So this is what we see, and I think uh, this is also somewhat a motivation of my I, my study. That uh, you know the retail sales trends have grown exponentially. Uh, just to share some data with you, that while the retail industry is growing at nine or ten percent, the e-commerce within that is growing at a rate of study. So uh, here is some data worldwide. The e-commerce sector, like every sector, has some emissions. E-commerce sector's emissions. Uh, almost 60% fall under logistics and packaging. Uh, so that's the important part. That as a as a company, if 60% of your uh, area where you could create value is logistics and packaging, then that's where you have to focus on. And I think as consumers, there is little thought. And I'm you know at every stage I add the word consumer because ultimately we are purchasing things, but I don't think there is any consideration for what impact we are creating on the environment. So. Uh, the motivation of my study is really this that happened uh, to me and to most of us. These are packages that I have ordered. So you know, at times at our household, we realize that we've ordered stuff, and there is enormous amount of packaging that comes our way. 
In addition to that, uh, there are multiple entries that come into your doorstep. So there's not one, but probably three people who are walking into your uh, uh, onto your household. So my topic is ESG enabling value creation in Indian uh, e-commerce. Just to give you a perspective on the literature review and uh, you know some of the uh, key points that came into play. And then I put them in buckets of uh, transportation and packaging. I had set my barometers from 2018 because it's a relatively new industry and also to be fair ESG as a term which you know some so under these keywords I've come across some 500 papers which I scanned and uh, my my study is right now focused on 165 of those 500 papers which I'm focused on. Yes, there have been there have been uh, uh, you know issues of e-mobility or drone packaging and drone deliveries which are uh, still at a discussion stage. But I don't think that it's really as a policy these e-commerce companies have put that. The other important point is that there is value creation that consumers seek. They want the companies to be ESG, to have a ESG roadmap, uh, stuff that we consume at home, and in turn stuff that we order from, uh, order or get into our households. And most of them are coming through uh, online platforms. The e-commerce industry in 2019 produced two billion pounds of uh, plastic waste. And uh, we are the fifth largest in this list uh, across the country. While we all know that in terms of emission, India stands number three after China and US. But only in sure in terms of plastic, this is our ranking. Uh, globally, the contribution of logistics and transportation, as I've shared earlier, is 60% of, of this uh, emission norm. The World Economic Forum report also states that if this is the way we go, by 2030, the emissions will rise by 32% and the congestion on, on roads by 36%. 73% of the millennials also studied, and this is what literature says, which is a very positive sign that people and consumers are conscious of the companies they deal with. I've really uh, uh, shown you and how I arrived at the 500 papers. I started an inside out approach on coming onto my topic. So, started with e commerce, looked at the ESG roadmap. What is the consumer awareness uh, on this factor? Then move to the most primary things, which are logistics and packaging, which is 60%. And then saw what's the value creation happening on the logistic and packaging front by these companies. Parallelly, uh, there has to be a, a matrix by why I would have chosen logistics and packaging. The SASB standards, uh, is, you know, it's a well-renowned standard. They do, they've done industry research. This is a fantastic topic to pick up. Thank you. But again, you know, I've been in the industry, so I'm used to, you know, PS the balloon. So please don't take me wrongly. I was just thinking from the academic's point of view. So this research is indeed a sustainable research. Even if you want to give example of ESG in research, so this is a good example of a sustainable research, and this will uh, continue for the next couple of years, like you said. But one apprehension that I have in mind is how do you get data to substantiate? Because the problem is. See, you will not find enough secondary data on, on these topics and primary data, like you rightly said, that these e-commerce companies uh, for, you know, for these take of uh, logistics or ease of management, they'll always give it out or uh, they'll uh, engage third parties. So if you want qualitative primary data to substantiate your research and, you know, create something, how will you do that? I mean, is, isn't that a challenge that you think that will come up? So you get my apprehension. Absolutely. Because this is a fantastic topic to work on. Fantastic topic. And I think the relevance has increased during the COVID period. Because now, even even I, even if you could go down to the shop and buy something, you're used to getting out online. And especially with Blinkit. Yeah, and, uh, so this is not only about Amazon, it is about anything. I mean, if my daughter wants a... Uh, if, uh, at 12 a.m., obviously, we know the shops are closed, but big, big guy. and even Swiggy. So, you pick it up from so this is a very good topic. But, ma'am, what is your opinion? If primary data, ka shayad, I don't know. Yeah, actually, okay. that perspective somehow, I think, first of all, as you said, no, uh, educating the customers. So, educating to your respondents is also a challenge right. uh, while collecting the data. So, your perspective as uh, Co-chair is also saying your perspective is very good. Your identification of research problem is 
is very contemporary, it is very timely, it is very re very relevant and uh, it's only that how will you be able to collect primary data. Actually you will get problems but uh, the respondent will not be able to understand it as a problem. Exactly. For example, exactly. for example, like uh, uh, I'm using this uh, you know screen. So therefore now as a respondent I'm aware that my eyes are not uh, supporting you. Okay. This is my problem. I will be able to tell you. But regarding this packaging and uh, you know these logistics also, like you are saying that ordering, sequencing in the orders and etc. Maybe the respondents they are not ready for that particular stage. So, <clears throat> just to answer your question, sir, first, there is a, for example, the Amazon the sessions, paper presenters, participants, members of the organizing committee, ladies and gen gentlemen of the audience. I take this opportunity to welcome each one of you to the valedictory ceremony of the National Workshop on the E in ESG, Reflections for Corporate Governance and Sustainability, in collaboration with National Forum for Corporate Governance, here at Terry School of Advanced Studies. We were honored to host the esteemed speakers and panelists for this national workshop. The active participation in the event from different fields and professions only affirms the relevance and meaningfulness of this event and its theme. Over the course of the day, we had a synergy of fruitful discussions and talent quotient coupled with cerebral grilling that developed the creative palette, the kind of stuff that originates in and pushes our conscience, the very conscience that developed the concept of ESG in the first place. I now request our professor, Dr. Sukanya Das, for the valedictory address. So, welcome to for this workshop today. And maybe welcome in interdisciplinary areas because the one of the that is of the workshop that we are having as hosted by the school has been uh, it has been quite in a way not limited to the professionals in one specific areas but as we can see that we have a diverse field of specializations that and uh, who have been participated and who have had an enriching session and um, I hope that it will be had and add on to the to your uh, to your feather to be uh, in a way to take it forward with the type of uh, insights that you have gained from today's session as well as from the paper presenters uh, who have um, you have had their experience for the first time. Uh, so I hope that you will take it forward and it will be in, in a way maybe later when you will be designing or developing for new sort of a policy groups it will be in, in a way will be helping you. So thank you again and yeah now we can start up. Okay. I would now request Mr. Mus uh, Ms. Muskan to present the platform to <laughs> Time for certificates. Uh, so, for paper presentation, uh, Mr. Pankaj Chandra, who presented on the topic uh, ESG enabling value creation in Indian economics. I can announce those who are here. Okay.
Yes, definitely. And uh, now we go to the coordinators for the uh, workshop. Kim Bhakti. Thank you so much. Yeah.